ತೀರಕ್ಕೆ ಹಳೆ ನೆನಪುಗಳ ದೂರಲ್ಲಿ ಬಿಡು ಬೀಸುವ ಚಳಿ ಗಾಳಿಗೆ ತರಗಲೆಗಳ ಚಿತೆಯವರಲ್ಲಿ ಚೈತ್ರೋದಯ ಜ್ವಾಲೆಗೆ ವೆರಿ ಗುಡ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ರವೀಂದ್ರ ಕೋರೆಯರ್ ಚೇರ್ಮನ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಹೋಲ್ ಹಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ಲಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ವ್ಯೂವರ್ಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ದಾಸೋವ ಲೈವ್ ವೆಬ್ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಚ್ ದ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಹ್ಯಾವಿಂಗ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಪೆನಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಶನ್ ಆನ್ ಈಕ್ವಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಲೆವಿ ಕನ್ಸರ್ನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಸೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ಸ್ ದ ಆಲ್ ದ ಫೋರ್ ಕಾರ್ನರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಟುಡೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎನ್ಲೈಟನ್ ಆಲ್ ಅವರ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಚ್ on behalf of all the viewers and on behalf of managing committee members of bangalore bench i wholeheartedly welcome the past chairman of sirc bangalore bench and moderator of the today session ca kota s srinivas for the today session uh, welcome you sir uh, dear members the today's panelist sir ca sachin kumar vp on behalf of all the viewers and on behalf of managing committee members of bangalore bench i welcome uh, ca sachin kumar and also the expert in the income tax and tribunals uh, now he is practicing as an advocate so none other than ca narendra jain on all the viewers heartedly welcome ca jain to the today's session we have with uh, another personality uh, the expert in the subject uh, ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಭರತ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಆನ್ ಬಿಹಾಪ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ದಿ ವಿವರ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜಿಂಗ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಗ್ಳೂರ್ ಬ್ಯಾಂಚ್ ಐ ಹೋಲ್ ಹಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ಲಿ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಮಿಸ್ಟರ್ ಭರತ್ ಲಕ್ಷ್ಮೀ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಟುಡೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಯು ಅವೇರ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ಎನ್ ದ ಫಿಫ್ಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಲೈವ್ ವೆಬ್ ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ದಾಸೋವ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ದ ವೇ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ವಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಮಾರ್ಚ್ ಏಟೀನ್ತ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ಆಸ್ ಪರ್ ಎಚ್ ಓ ಗೈಡ್ಲೈನ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ರಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಎಚ್ ಓ we are conducting every month uh, 10 sessions that today is uh, this month september this is a third session uh, members and tomorrow uh, this week this is the last session and next week we have scheduled the sessions three sessions on 16th uh, september we have an, a special section on session on cooperative sector is going to be address the two speakers the one topic is on practical case studies in gold loan by ca umesh bolmal from belagavi and in comparison between two cooperatives act in karnataka is going to be addressed by ca ravindranath bv sagar and we are also inviting the president of uh, savarda who is actually always telling the requirement of chartered accounts is essential for the cooperative sector even the cooperative it is a little bit uh, stating uh, on the issue so he is going to address on that and again 17th september we have an uh, 60th session from one more past uh, chairman of sirc from uh, kochi it is on subject on company edit 2019 20 and covid related uh, pronouncements of icai by ca joman k george and after that we have an uh, session from again from advocate on 18th september intellectual property rights ipr by hari prasad ms this all the sessions we have scheduled uh, next week and three, uh, this week it is in third session and 58 session as i earlier said the four pillars of the three hour session today's members kindly note that uh, don't uh, start with time it is uh, 4 to 7 o'clock you will get the three hours uh, structure cp so on behalf of uh, managing committee members of bangor bench i all heartedly welcome all the viewers uh, who have registered more than 600 register uh, members have registered for the today's sessions for your active participation members and again i wholeheartedly welcome the uh, moderator kota s srinivas and the panelist c a sachin kumar bp c a narendra jain and mr bharat lakshmi narayan for the today's sessions i request our secretary to uh, introduce all the dignitaries to all the viewers or to srinivas thank you chairman uh, i welcome uh... panelists moderators and all the members and viewers of today's program very interesting uh, session on panel discussion on equalization levy we have uh, with us uh, moderator as a kota srinivas and panelist uh, as a sachin uh, ca sachin kumar ca narendra jain and bharat lakshmi rayan company secretary it's my proud privilege to give a brief introduction uh, 
of a panelist and moderator. Actually speaking, there doesn't require any introduction because uh, our uh, moderator, Kota Srinivas, is a past SIRC chairman and past uh, chairman of Bangalore branch of SIRC and uh, is uh, doing his uh, chairmanship in Bangalore branch of ICA. Bangalore branch is awarded the best branch of the SIRC and uh, he, is, he was instrumental in collecting uh, around 1.5 crores of rupees for uh, towards CA Benevolent Fund uh, during his chairmanship of SIRC and he is an active member and uh, he is an instrumental in conducting uh, annual uh, residential refresher course he started and he is instrumental in developing a digital project of SIRC. Visiting faculty of ICA and uh, authored a book named Reference for Chartered Accountants which was released by Bangalore branch of ICA a study circle series booklet. He is also a life member of Karnataka State Chartered Accountants Association, life member of Bombay Chartered Accountants Society founder of group dynamics a study group on international taxation and at bangalore and chennai and is very renownedly fondly known for is a think differently act perfectly with this brief introduction i present before you our today's moderator kota s srinivas namaskara sir welcome and uh, our panelist ca bp sachin kumar sir very senior member and fellow member of our institute is a Chief Strategic Partner of uh, Mrs. Mano Manohar Chaudhary and Associate. He is a non-executive director of London-based multinational company. He has a wide range of experience in uh, advising leading Indian corporates and MNCs on various domestic and international tax matters. He is a visiting faculty of ICA and he was a visiting faculty of uh, at renowned MBA colleges in Bangalore. He has addressed members of Income Tax Appellate Tribunal and along with uh, Sri TN, uh, TN Manoharan sir at the Judicial Academy, Mumbai. He has, he has presented various papers relating to direct taxes, analytics and technology in seminars organized by the Institute of uh, Chartered Accountants of India across India. He is an IAM Bangalore alumni. With this brief introduction, I present before you CABP Sachin Kumar. Welcome sir. We have one more uh, renowned panelist, is none other than CA Narendra Jain, BCOM, FCA, CS, and LLB. He is a rank holder in CS as well as CS, he is hold many ranks in his uh, cap, and uh, is presently practicing as ad advocate heading NNMS Legal Chambers Bangalore, having experience in advising clients and uh, handling tax litigation, income tax, transfer pricing, corporate tax, and international taxation authored a book, Analysis of Transfer Pricing Judgments, published by CCH, and co-authored so many other books. Made more than 150 presentation at various seminars, workshops, study circles, etc. conducted by ICA, CTC, other association and co colleges. Is a faculty of CA final students, convener of Bangalore subgroup of Chamber of Tax Consultant, Mumbai. With this brief introduction, I, I present before you CA Narendra Jain. Welcome you, sir. We have with us one more eminent uh, panelist uh, from our uh, CS Institute is none other than CS Bharat Lakshmi Narayana. He is a Bachelor of Commerce, Associate Company Secretary of uh, Institute of Company Secretary of India, Bachelor of Karnataka Law, as Karnataka State Law University. He is having more than 12 years of experience in the field of taxation. He focuses on advising clients on Indian and uh, cross border tax issues. Tax, op, uh, tax optimization strategies and transfer pricing. He also regularly attends to matters involving representation before the tax authorities and income tax appellate tribunal. With this brief introduction, I present before you Bharat Lakshmarana. Welcome you to you also. I welcome all the moderator and speakers and viewers. Over to moderator and panelists. Yeah, before the moderator is taking over, just uh, one observation I have made. For the uh, today's session, the four speakers are there. You can see the first uh, name Bharat Lakshminar in our country is Bharat. The name is Bharat. And right side we are having in our Prime Minister name Narendra, Narendra Kumar Jai. And uh, yes, we all love the cricket. Uh, always the person we cannot forget, Sachin is there. And uh, yes, Venkat Sankata Bandaga, Venkat Ramana, Srinivas is uh, <laughs> already there from in our MC. <laughs> so, Srinivas. So all both will definitely, uh, the three of us, uh, definitely 
take it this uh, series for the members every day two hours they will listen so it is an offer and uh, combo offer today from bharat narendra and uh, sachin srinivas good jugal bandi jugal bandi good jugal bandi today over to kota srinivas ji yeah thank you thank you chairman and uh, thank you uh, the secretary uh, secretary for uh, briefly introducing all of us uh, and of course uh, the final touch by the chairman first of all let me let me thank uh, the chairman and uh, the branch for uh, accepting our proposal or this idea of uh, this panel discussion usually when once uh, you have uh, this webinars will be one person speak when we spoke to the chairman he said yes uh, we will try this out so first of all let me thank him for this particular uh, uh, panel discussion which uh, we are going to witness for the next 3 hours so today's discussion uh, like a panel discussion on inflation levy which uh, we talk about concerns and uh, solutions and as a moderator i'll be dealing with the concerns and i'll put all the concerns to the panelists where uh, they will uh, try to give the solutions so i am for concerns and the panelists are for uh, solutions i will set this uh, we know this uh, inflation levy and it's not a, a new word or uh, and it's not a buzzword now but it's a hot topic discussed and uh, deliberated across uh, countries and we know that uh, it was introduced uh, in india way back in 2016 now to understand any new subject or concept we ask three questions why what and how and in this three hours discussion with three panelists we will also be dealing with these three questions what is equalization levy and why equalization levy and how to understand equalization levy with some of the issues and concerns so why equalization levy and what is equalization levy i'll be taking a few minutes uh, to just tell you briefly about uh, why equalization levy was uh, brought into this uh, enactment and what is equalization levy so in briefly i will tell you about what is equalization levy then how to understand equalization levy that uh, we will leave it to the panelists i'll be uh, posing certain questions and uh, they'll be giving their uh, whatever uh, solutions so as i said uh, initially i'll be dealing with uh, these two questions and finally we will go to the panelists where they'll be answering some of the concerns raised by us and as we know this uh, international taxation is an evolving subject so a lot of changes uh, are happening and uh, equalization levy being part of international taxation there is no exception to this so even though we say that uh, today we are uh, dealing with some of the concerns and uh, we are giving some solutions this may not be final so as on today whatever the law is there based on that today's uh, legislation or today's uh, tax laws we have uh, tried to uh, put in uh, bring forward some uh, concerns and uh, also to answer certain, certain uh, uh, give some solutions but as it is evolving there may be more concerns and more uh, uh, issues in the future now we will deal with uh, whatever is there at present so now uh, why equalization levy so as i said uh, three questions the first question is uh, why equalization levy like many mnc's across the world are more so in the uh, usa at multiple business connections a business uh, structures as such like uh, even though the source country is usa there there is a, there was a situation where they had uh, business structures or various uh, companies across the globe like uh, where it is uh, tax seven uh, nations or low tax jurisdictions so in uh, many cases or many mnc's like to give an example like uh, google uh, apple uh, yahoo or cisco which are uh, tax residents of usa but because of this planning or uh, structures they were not uh, paying adequate taxes to us government so us government was worried that even though these these companies are uh, uh, tax residents of this particular nation but they are not getting the relevant tax from these companies as such so they had the different structures like one of the one of the company had something called a, a subsidiary in uh, dutch and two uh, companies in irish so they were uh, telling like a dutch sandwich between two irish companies so uh, not only usa many countries were worried because of uh, all these uh, tax structures as such then they all uh, thought that uh, they should find out a solution and they approached oecd in the year 2013 and because of this work that there was a concept called uh, base erosion and profit shifting 
So in uh, the example, what I said in that US companies, MNCs, where they had shifted their base, uh, shifted their base meaning like majority of the uh, earnings were in a different uh, jurisdictions where it is low tax jurisdiction or tax havens. So there was a shifting of uh, the base and uh, uh, profit sharing. So base erosion and profit sharing was the concept that was uh, asked for OEC to discuss and deliberate among them. So in 2013, they approached uh, OECD and OECD started uh, discussing about these things and deliberated and they came out with a action plan called as uh, BEPS action plan. So in the year 2015, they came with a BEPS action plan uh, with uh, 15 action plans and first of the action plan was with respect to digital taxation. So when we talk about uh, digital taxation, so what we understand by digital taxation? And as we know now, because of advancement of uh, digital and telecom sectors, the business models and methods have changed. Even though the business is same, like uh, if you see the earlier business or now business, uh, the current uh, business, the business has not changed. That is, now also there is purchase and sale of uh, goods or purchase and sale of services. But the methodology of business has changed. Like if you see the accounting, the basic accounting principle has not changed, but because of so many standards coming in, so the method of accounting or some of the like uh, you have standards, your procedures, so the complexities have been changed. So now the business uh, complexities has changed to address all these complexities. Maybe they have to come out with new tax structures as such. Earlier it was uh, physical presence. So whenever uh, you have to deal with the business like purchase and sale of goods, the seller and buyer was supposed to meet each other. So meet and then the transaction used to happen. Now there's no question of uh, physical presence. Now even uh, virtual presence will happen and there'll be sale of goods or services. So because of this uh, advancement of technology or invention of more and more technologies, these new structures are coming and to address these issues, the new tax laws are coming. If you understand in, uh, or if you remember in uh, Mahabharat, like uh, Eksha Prashne was there, like where uh, Yama will ask a few questions to uh, Dharmaraya. One of the question is, what transfers, I mean, so what travels faster than air? He says mind. Today it is not just mind, even this technology transfers faster than air. So today sitting here, we can, uh, of course, uh, go across the globe with uh, whatever uh, the, uh, this thing, like uh, if you have a smartphone, if you have a uh, iPad or a internet, I mean, uh, computer with an internet uh, connections, you can explore or go around the world. We, we were also telling that uh, after globalization, we call it as a global village, the entire world as a global village. Now we should still uh, go further and say, it's not just global village, global in your hand, like, uh, we have one more uh, saying in uh, Hindu mythology that Aham Brahmasmi. Aham Brahmasmi means uh, in every uh, life there is God. So God is there within every one of us. So like that now I have to, we have to uh, say another word Aham Vishwasmi. Like uh, entire world is in our hands or we are in the, with the world. So with a smartphone or with a internet connection and a computer we can explore or go around the world. So that is that advancement of technology as such. Earlier I was telling about uh, what you call this physical presence. Now we are talking about uh, virtual presence. So this, because of this, uh, uh, what do you call this virtual presence? There was a uh, concept, means concept called digital taxation. So to address this digital taxation in this uh, BEPS action plan, the first action plan was with respect to digital taxation. So they gave the three structure, uh, um, three structures to address this uh, digital taxation. The three structures are first one is uh, to have an excess with uh, significant economic presence, and the second structure is withholding of taxation, and the third structure was equalization levy. So OECD came out with this action plans in the year 2015 with three structures or three methodologies of taxing these e-commerce uh, transactions. First one was significant economic presence taxation, then second one was withholding taxation, and third one is equalization level. Withholding taxation, of course, uh, in India and uh, most of the countries are uh, having that, and India also is having. In the year 2016, after this uh, BEPS action plan, India was the first country 
to levy this inflation levy. Like uh, other countries also started levying uh, uh, taxes on e-commerce services, but that was not in the name of equalization levy. But India was the first country to uh, levy this equalization levy in the year 2016. In 2018, they started with a significant economic presence uh, taxation also, but subsequently they are postponed to uh, assessment year 21-22. So as of now, India has started with equalization levy in the year 2016. So to address this uh, uh, e-commerce transaction or to tax the e-commerce transaction, this equalization levy as per the recommendations of OECD, uh, OECD, India started this. So why equalization levy? This is the meaning or uh, this is the answer I can give you for why equalization levy. Then the next question is, what is equalization levy? So when we, before answering what is equalization levy, in this phrase equalization levy, we have got two words. One is equalization and the second word is levy. Levy means uh, to impose uh, tax, cess or fine, fine or fee as such. So even if you see section 43B, it talks about any tax, cess, levy or duty. If it is not paid within a specified date, it will be disallowed. So levy is also equal to a tax, fine or fee. Then what do we understand by equalization? So equalization in that, if you see, there is a word called equal. What is equal? Equal is equal. So how to uh, define equal in English means equal is equal or similar or same. Then what do we understand by equalization? So equalization, the dictionary meaning of equalization may be to equalize a situation means to give everyone the same rights or opportunities. For example, in education, wealth or social status. So when we talk about equalization or giving equal rights, this is all done by certain uh, rules or regulations or uh, frameworks by the government. If you want to understand equalization with respect to sports, say for example in, uh, uh, what do you call this, uh, football or uh, hockey, if the two teams are playing and if one team uh, scores uh, a goal and subsequently the other team uh, scores a goal, they say that this, uh, this team has equalized the goals as such, that scores are equal. When it comes to equalization levy with respect to taxation or international taxation, they call it as fiscal equalization levy. So what is this uh, uh, fiscal equalization levy and what is the objective of fiscal equalization levy is? The objective of uh, equalization levy is to ensure tax neutrality between different business structures. So tax neutrality be between uh, different business structures, maybe a resident business uh, structure and non-resident uh, business uh, people. So to bring in tax neutrality and of course also to bring tax neutrality among the different nations as such. Now here, earlier in international taxation, we know the concept of uh, COR and CO, uh, COS. COR means country of residence and COS is country of source. So we have uh, been uh, understanding international taxation uh, by studying various uh, models and methods. There are two concepts of taxing international taxation. One is based on the country of residence and the other one is based on country of source as such. Now with this e-commerce or e digital taxation, we have come across uh, something called COM, that is country of market. So in this e-commerce transactions or the, uh, uh, digital transaction, what happens? Even the markets where uh, uh, the companies are earning certain incomes, that particular country also has got some uh, means in the circulation levy, they have some scope of collecting certain taxes as such. Now, uh, what is equation levy? Briefly, I have uh, explained. Now, we are talking about e commerce. I have been explaining about, I have been mentioning about e commerce. What do we understand by e commerce? Of course, uh, there is a separate uh, question which will be posed to the panelists and they will give uh, exact meaning of uh, uh, e commerce. Of course, when uh, when we were doing when we were studying, we didn't know anything about e-commerce. In fact, when I joined my college, uh, means after completing my SLC, my father said, "You just go and uh, join for commerce," and I just went and joined for commerce because a uh, few of my elder cousin brothers they were doing commerce. So my father said, "You also go and join for uh, commerce." When I went to college uh, first PUC, I saw there are uh, commerce A, B, C, D. There was nothing called e-commerce there. A, B, C, D commerce was there. A, B, C, D means uh, section A, section B, section C, section D. We didn't know anything about 
e-commerce at that particular point of time. Of late, uh, because of this uh, uh, like advancement of technology, as I was mentioning, the computers came, then internet came, then uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, so many other uh, advancements are happening. So this e-commerce word has come. And uh, the introduction of uh, equalization levy, as I said, uh, uh, India was the first country to introduce equalization levy. So how it was introduced? So the Indian government also got a cue from uh, the Indian cinemas as such. So in Indian cinema, we see uh, like a uh, lot of movies comes in parts. Like in uh, in Hindi cinema, if you take, uh, we got this, uh, we have a series of uh, movies on Golmal Returns or ABCD. When it comes to South Indian uh, cinemas, we know that uh, the famous uh, movie that uh, uh, Bahubali 1 and 2, then coming to Kannada movie, we know we have uh, witnessed KGF part 1 and we are uh, waiting for KGF uh, chapter 2 as such. So taking a cue from all these things, Indian government also has uh, in the, uh, introduced equalization levy in two parts, equalization levy 1 and equalization levy 2. So the equalization levy 1, it started in the year 2016 and equalization levy that is year 2 has been introduced in two, 2020 as such. And this is not part of Income Tax Act, this is part of Finance Act as such. And uh, if uh, just to tell you about uh, EL1 and EL2, some of the differences uh, between EL1 and EL2, tax rates, with respect to tax rates in EL1, it is uh, at the rate of 6% and EL2, it is at the rate of 2%. Then the payment uh, methodology in EL1, it is monthly and EL2, it is uh, quarterly payment. Then the type of collection in EL, one that is uh, first uh, this thing, it is withholding of tax. So the person who is taking the services has to withhold the tax. In EL2, there is uh, a direct payment. The person who is receiving the money, he has to make the payment. Then exemption limit with under EL1 is up to 1 lakh and under EL2 it is rupees 2 crores. The coverage in EL1 it is online advertising and in EL2 it is e-commerce operator. Then exemption with respect to EL1 is uh, B2C. So EL1 applies only to B2B transactions and not to B2C transactions. In EL2, there is no specific exemption for B2C. One or two similarities, uh, applicability, it applies to both non-residents. So it only applies to non-residents. Both EL1 and EL2 applies only to non-residents who don't have a permanent establishment in India. So a non-resident, if he has got a permanent establishment in India, that will not be applicable. So only to non-residents it applies and the tax credits as of now it is not known. So these are uh, some of the differences and uh, similarities of EL1 and EL2. Now uh, we will move on to the uh, panelists uh, once again uh, on behalf of the Bangalore branch. I welcome all the three panelists. We have three panelists, uh, Sachin uh, uh, Kumar who is practicing as a chartered accountant. Then we have CA Narendra Jain who is practicing as an advocate. And we have uh, C.S. Bharat, who is practicing uh, as a income tax uh, uh, litigation matters as such. Now I will uh, move on to this, uh, what do you call this, what is equation levy and how to understand equation levy regarding these things. I'll be asking few questions and they'll be giving their uh, views on that. First question I'd like to ask uh, Sachin, how has uh, equation levy been implemented? Sachin, so come and uh, this yeah. is your first question. Yeah, right. In fact, as uh, as uh, thank you, uh, Bangalore Branch, and thank you, Kotas, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity to uh, share some of the some of the thoughts on this equalization levy. And uh, I feel privileged to be there amongst uh, Narendra and Bharat to be uh, addressing uh, on this particular topic. Uh, now, coming to the question that you posed, how this uh, EL has been implemented in India, as you uh, beautifully have narrated, that, uh, this equalization levy it is a charge that is imposed by government on certain uh, transactions, which, uh, uh, you know, online transactions, and which by nature, inherently, there are certain challenges for the Income Tax uh, uh, Act to, uh, you know, to tax these kind of transactions. As you rightly mentioned, country of source, country of residence, you know, country of market was losing out on revenue. So therefore, inherently there were certain challenges. So therefore, this was found necessary. It was required to have this equalization levy. 
as uh, you mentioned, this was first introduced in Finance Act 2016 to cover online advertisement transaction. Online advertisement transaction, which provided for an equalization levy at that, at that particular point of time at 6% of the amount of consideration received or receivable by person who is an online vendor. Right? And uh, this uh, has a second version, which is introduced in uh, Finance Act 2020, where the ambit of this equalization levy has been extended now to cover e-commerce transactions. And uh, this is uh, charged now at the rate of 2% of the consideration received by e-commerce operator. Of course, this I'm sure will be discussed in uh, subsequent question and answer. So therefore, I'm not getting into the definition of e-commerce operator. However, EL1 uh, in, this, uh, in this particular scheme of things, covers online digital advertisement services, whereas EL2 covers uh, equalization levy to e-commerce supplies and services. And uh, uh, both EL1 and EL2 are levied for uh, on the consideration received by non-residents, whereas EL1 is collected from the payer, whereas EL2 is collected from non-resident payees. And, uh, uh, you know, as far as uh, this uh, one sec uh, section 166 is concerned, uh, you know, it provides that uh, eligible deductees, uh, you know, shall deduct the equalization levy from the amount payable, that is 6%. If the amount of consideration that, uh, this is for advertisement, uh, uh, you know, uh, services, that uh, it shall be deducted at the rate of 6% on aggregate amount of uh, consideration, uh, provided that consideration in the previous year has to exceed 1 lakh rupees. However, in the equalization levy 2, which is applicable uh, for this online, uh, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce supplies and services, there it is uh, the the limit is uh, 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 limit is two crores that 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 particular thing. The equalization levy so deducted. Uh, in fact, having said that, the equalization levy so deducted during any calendar year shall be paid by the deductor to the credit of the government by the 7th of the month immediately following the said, said uh, month, that is as far as equalization levy 1 is concerned. As far as equalization levy 2 is concerned, you know, there are, uh, you know, four quarters and the June quarter, uh, it has to be paid in the month of uh, before 7th July. Similarly, September quarter, it has to be paid on or before 7th October and 7th January and 31st. Last quarter, the uh, March quarter has to be paid on or before 31st March. And uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, you know, equalization levy return need to be filed annually, both in case of EL1 and EL2 on uh, 30th June of the financial uh, following financial year. I mean, uh, following the financial year end. So this is what uh, is the scheme. And of course, this is to be, uh, this is implemented uh, by the board. Uh, and it is, uh, the board is uh, defined in this particular case. In uh, 164, it is, board is defined to say that, this is a CBDT. So therefore, uh, it is implemented by the income tax department and uh, the officers, the assigning officers of the income tax uh, act will be the assigning officers for the, this equalization level. So this is what is the brief of how it is implemented here in India. Thank you. Thank you, Sachin. Uh, now, uh, let me welcome uh, Narendra. As you know, this uh, particular uh, law has been uh, through the Finance Act, not through the Income Tax Act. So can you tell us what is the legislative competence competency for this equation? Yeah, one, uh, one, sir, one minute, sir. Uh, this one, uh, uh, just uh, once you ask the question, the yeah. person who is uh, answering only can make it unmute. Otherwise, all sounds okay. are coming. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Hmm? Okay. okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Bangalore branch uh, for giving this opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, this new topic or evolving topic. Uh, though EL1 is not new, EL2 is certainly new and a hot topic for discussion and debate. Uh, it brings in a whole lot of new aspects for taxation. Now, when we talk of a new tax levy, it always brings in the concept whether whether the legislative competence is there for that uh, levy of that new tax. In India, the constitution is sovereign and the 
the government derives its power from the constitution so it is necessary that the within the four corners of the constitution this levy is uh, brought in Uh, having said that it is rarely seen that uh, a tax law is struck down on unconstitutionality or that there is no legislative competence very very few cases we will find in that context coming to the equalization levy equalization levy one was brought in in 2016 with a tax on advertisement uh, surprisingly no one has challenged the constitutional validity of that levy till date on the legis- legislative competent uh, competency because uh, the entry 55 of list 2 of schedule 7 of constitution gave the power to states to levy tax on advertisements other than published in newspaper radio etc or the like, power to levy tax on the advertisement was with states that power in 2016 that entry was omitted in 2016 when gst was brought in but at the time when equalization levy 1 was introduced that power rested with the state so the question that would arise is when this el1 was brought in how could the center levy tax on the on the advertisement the exact words used in the entry 55 are also tax on advertisement so there would be a challenge in that context whether it is a whether there is a conflict between entry 55 of list 2 and what the uh, equalization committee had recommended equalization committee had recommended that there is a competency to bring in equalization levy by virtue of entry 92c tax on services of list 1 which was again subsequently omitted in fact it was never enforced it was never notified and the service tax always remained as a residual entry under entry 97 has good as well tax where the legislative competency was accepted under entry 97 that is a residual entry under list 1 so 92c was one entry which the Uh, equal, uh, the equalization committee said would be applicable, but then there was that was never notified. Second, they said those are residual entry, and they gave the example of well tax and service tax to drive home the point that equalization levy could fit in the entry ninety seven of list one. But before we address that point, the main point I would feel for determining the legislative competence is what is this nature of tax? Whether it is income tax. something like income tax some kind of direct tax or some kind of indirect tax there has been this again this topic has been mutually debated and there are points for both whether it is direct tax or whether in indirect tax we can keep on debating that for 3 hours there will be no answer for that there's no need in we will not go into that but the point is if it is direct tax what are the consequences and if it is indirect tax what are the consequences if it is direct tax and it is a tax on income as the committee suggests that we are not calling it income tax but it is form some form of tax on income and we are putting it as a tax on gross basis when in 2016 the equalization levy was introduced now then the entry 82 still cover it but then the issue would arise what would happen to the tax treaties you are over- overriding tax treaties then article 51c would come into picture which would say that you should have respect and you should have respect for international law and treaty obligation you will be directly going in conflict with the treaty law you will be making then this would be in colorable legislation because to just to override the treaties which you couldn't have validly done legally done by virtue of section 90 sub section 2 just to override those treaties you are bringing the tax on income as a colorable legislation as a part of finance act that those issues would arise if you take a view that the uh equalization levy is an income tax now if you take a view that equalization levy is not income tax and it is some sort of a transaction tax then it is very close to what would call as a gst no doubt for gst uh there is a power under article 246 capital a which overrides 246 of constitution because 246 takes you to the entry uh, to schedule 7 list 1 list 2 list 3. gst was brought in as a special article under 2 article 246 capital a which overrides the entries which are there in the list or to that extent schedule 246 itself 246 capital a gives power to both center and state to levy tax on sale of goods and services when it comes to interstate sales or import transactions the lev- the power is given to the parliament and that is how the ig under the igst act the reverse charge mechanism is there but the main point is article 269 capital a read with article 279 capital a to bring a charge for goods and service tax you need to have a recommendation of gst council 
Now, if you see the equalization levy, there is no recommendation of GST Council for this particular levy. And when there is no recommendation of GST Council, you couldn't bring a law bringing in something like an uh, equalization levy if we call it as a transaction tax or something like a GST. Also, it would also be con in conflict with the existing GST provisions where you have already uh, online uh, OIDAR where it is a chargeable service where non-resident is providing services as defined in the IGST Act 217. If that is already covered, then you bring in something like equalization levy, which is very equivalent or similar to that, at least in the context of online services. Uh, in the context of IGST, online goods are not there, but online services are there. So then the aspect theory also will come into picture, whether on the same transactions you are levied to taxes and whether it is protected by that. These are broad outlines of the competencies or the issues which arise out of legislative competences. Uh, and those will have to be addressed as the uh, time goes forward. Uh, and we'll have to first determine what is the nature of this levy, whether it is a direct tax or an indirect tax. Over to uh, moderator. Yeah. He spoke about uh, the legislative competence. The next question I would like to pose to you only whether uh, in this equation levy one and two, whether it satisfies the test of uh, territorial nexus, like I was mentioning about uh, physical presence. Now we are talking about uh, virtual presence. In fact, uh, recent uh, amendments to the section six, uh, all these years uh, from 1961 onwards, we are talking about if an individual is. Uh, physically present in India and become resident. Now, even if he is not president, present in India for one day also, for uh, satisfying some other uh, conditions, he is deemed to be a resident in India. Like that, now how to uh, fix the territorial nexus, uh, whether it satisfies, that is the question. Yeah. So territorial nexus, again, uh, it comes out of Article 245 of Constitution, that given that we are a sovereign country, the laws can be made for that country. Uh, the concept of territorial nexus is that one country cannot make laws which interfere with the operations in other countries. Having said that, there, there is some, there we need to understand one, one concept of territorial nexus versus the extraterritorial operation. Because today world, the way technology has evolved, for example, there could be a terrorist activity outside India, which could have an effect in India. So the question is, can India take any action? There could be a, a virus attack which is emanating from outside India, but which could affect the computer resources in India. So the territorial nexus doctrine, the whole question, there are two aspects to this. Whether you look at the actual conduct in a country or you look at a conduct which is outside India, but which has an effect in India. So, for example, if you take this computer uh, virus attacks which emanate from outside India, but which has an effect in India. So we call it as an effect doctrine under the uh, Indian panel, uh, under the under the general territorial nexus principles. And this is brought in in section 4.3 of Indian panel, IPC, Indian panel code, where you say if the virus attack is from outside India, but it affects the computer resource in India, there is a possibility to try such offenses in India. Similar provisions are also there in various other laws. For example, say, uh, uh, the competition laws. There could be a combination or arrangement which is happening outside India, but which could affect the the competitiveness in the Indian market, which these are, this is an effect doctrine, which has been accepted worldwide. And if there are causes and effects, which affects the Indian territory or welfare of the Indian territory, that can be accepted as a uh, sufficient territorial nexus. Now coming to article 245, but before we understand article 245, we need to see the history of article 245. This article 245 basically comes from the uh, uh, section article 99, section 99 of government of India act 1935 and its predecessor uh, uh, sections or Government of India Acts. We had quite a few of them, but if you look at 1915 Government of India Act and section 65 there under, the British made the Government of India Act and said that there was a parliament in India and what was the power of parliament in India? They said the power of parliament in India is for making laws which have for subjects within British India, for courts within India, things or places within India. The words were within British India. So if, 
but has the time passed if you see 1919 government of india act 1935 government of india act the words within british india were replaced by the words for british india that means if they are now within and for there is a huge amount of difference if i have to say within that means that place or thing should be in india whereas when i say for british india it could be anything to do with british india this concept or this differentiation was very beautifully discussed by the federal court uh, which is the predecessor of supreme court federal court was later on renamed as supreme court in the cases of uh, roll investment 1954 fcr 229 in the 1922 act there was a concept of dividend taxation where a dividend is paid by a non resident to non resident that means a non resident company paying dividend to another non resident and whether it could be taxed in british india section 3 uh section 3 ex section 4 read with explanation there under it provided that if the source of income is in india and even if not if the dividend is paid by one non resident to another non resident the income would be taxable in india the dividend would be taxable in india both for income tax purposes and super tax purposes so this was challenged under section 99 of government of india act 1935 to say that this is extra territorial it is a transaction between two non resident and there is no nexus with india how can you tax it the federal court with a three bench three bench judge uh, held that there is a territorial nexus because the words used are for british india it could be an income was originally from india the source of income was for india because the first non resident company had nine subsidiaries in india and those subsidiaries had done business in india and that income had moved from one company to another company and the payment from one non resident to non resident which had source in india is a sufficient nexus to tax it so these are the principles that we will have to keep it in mind for equalization levy also and has the thing stands today the concept of nexus itself has changed we cannot today go by physical nexus we'll have to go by value creation economic nexus or digital nexus so these new principle will have to come into picture if you look at the uh, equalization levy what it says that if a payment is made by a resident for certain goods or services there will be a levy of equalization on that now is it not similar to 916917 payment made by a resident for royalty payment made by a resident for fts if for fts and royalty payer can be a nexus why not payer be a nexus for the purpose of equalization levy so when it comes to at least the resident payments which are going out of india it would be difficult to argue that there is no territorial nexus given that the 245 uses a similar language like 1935 GOI act that it is for whole or any territory of india second point is there is no concept of accrual arisal in equalization levy it is a borderless tax the boundaries which are drawn in section 459 of the income tax act are not there in the uh, uh, in the equalization levy here the levy is on the payments made by residents based on ip based on the non resident to non resident uh, transactions having suffered in under some specified circumstances now if those tests are satisfied it would be difficult but here if the non resident to non resident transaction is there and the nexus is not sufficient the question would arise whether an ip is a sufficient nexus because if non resident comes to india for couple of days he uses indian ip address and then goes back and those transaction is actually outside india can that be a sufficient address nexus is something to be addressed but where the payment is from recipient i would feel that there is a good case to argue that the territorial nexus test may be satisfied given the wider language which is used uh, which is used in the uh, the 245 which is for any part of territory of india before i conclude i would like to highlight one delhi high court decision it is in the context of trademark law copyright act and uh, uh, under the intangible properties laws uh, worldwide uh, world wrestling federation wwe reshma collections it's a delhi high court now there was an apparel manufacturer reshma collection which was using the wwe mark in apparels which it had sold in the uh, mumbai the wwe filed a case in delhi high court saying that the my trademark violation is happening and therefore kindly give me the protection the single bench judge of delhi high court rejected the uh, petition suit saying that we do not have any jurisdiction and there is no business that the wwe is carrying on in india and the violation of trademark has happened in mumbai 
so what and then the division bench the matter went to division bench the division bench had to interpret the words business carried on in section 62 of copyright act and business carried on can where the consumer who is giving address uh, who is giving orders on the website of wwe where the goods are being delivered to the uh, persons in delhi whether you can say that that is a sufficient nexus or whether you can say that the wwe is carrying on business in delhi the division bench took a view that the wwe is carrying on business in delhi and there is a uh, jurisdiction to entertain that suit so you see how the times have changed where the virtual presence has also meant that uh, it was admitted position that wwe did not have any office in delhi no agent in delhi only goods were delivered based on the orders which were made on the website of wwe so this is how the law has been evolving in that looked in that perspective a digital presence could be a sufficient nexus at least for resident transactions is what view out like to take uh, with tl1 you know it is a uh, it's a duty of uh, a resident or the person who is making a payment to withhold the tax when it comes to el2 that is uh, the recently introduced law where the non resident e commerce operator has to discharge the tax liabilities so how difficult it would be for indian income tax authorities to catch hold of that uh, non resident and to monitor this particular law as such extra territorial reach of income tax authorities of course all the treaties have got uh, uh, a clause for exchange of information but uh, they don't have a clause uh, article in uh, dtas for uh, having that extra territorial uh, Uh, reach as such how to address yeah, this, this yes this is a very uh, practical issue that would arise as going forward given that the even the legislation of el is very sketchy you do not have many provisions you do not have the process for assessment so to that extent there is going to be a you know, challenge in terms of implementation now even if you see article 245 which gives power to legislature to make laws for territory whole or any part of territory of india and 452 it says you cannot struck down a law for extra territorial operations and these words were again interpreted way back in uh, in many earlier decisions they said the law could be extra territorial its operations could be difficult its implementation could be difficult that would not make the law uh, uh, invalid or anything so now assuming this there is a validity of law the question is how will the indian authorities implement India has taken a position. The EL committee took a position. It is not tax on income, so you cannot take a recourse to treaty also, because treaties do have lot of provisions for collection of tax or enforcement of tax or collection of information. Now the question would be whether those treaties, the information, those treaties can be used for the purpose of EL. Given that it's on India's position that we cannot use that, then it is going to be difficult to use those treaties, say for enforcement and collection of taxes. second mechanism second issue that would arise is uh, as i said you are being a sovereign country we cannot go and uh, enforce this law in any other country in all probability because they have made the provisions of 163 applicable to uh, el also uh, if you see section 178 of finance act 2016 which says that chapter 15 dealing with the uh, representative assessors etc liability in special cases that would be applicable to uh, el also has if it would have been income applicable to income so possibly one of the conditions under 163 is the payer person who is making a payment can be treated as an agent of a non resident so persons who is giving consideration for this possibly there could be taken as a uh, taken as an agent for the purpose of 163 but that would be very difficult in b to c transaction in b to b transaction possibly some mechanism the government could enforce and collect it second uh, uh, they could has going forward uh, do some study on payment gateways how the transactions are moving out of payment gateways this was one of the recommendation of el committee of 2016 and study that and make an enforcement uh, uh, enforcement way of doing it third point here is if you see again the 216 uh, el committee report they said equalization levy is a temporary mechanism till the global consensus evolve on taxation of digital economy so there could be a possibility like that the concept of sep virtual permanent establishment is brought into the treaties brought into the income tax at that point of time el may be taken out of context till then they they want to bring this and possibly force the uh, mncs to 
or the OECD countries to come at a consensus at an early point of time so that these concepts are brought in as a part of uh, treaties, as a part of income tax. Income tax, we do have SEP, but they'll have to commit as a part of treaties to really make it enforceable. So till then, the challenge would be in terms of enforcing this particular law. You're on mute, Kota uh, sir, you're on mute. Okay. Well, uh, you explained about uh, uh, the, what of the enforcement uh, extraterritorial reach of income tax authorities. Of course, when this was introduced in 2016, you see the uh, through the Finance Act, the Section 163 says recreation levy is uh, extended to all of India except the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So we cannot, uh, the income tax authorities cannot go to the state of Jammu and Kashmir, but they can go across the world and collect equation levy assets. Uh, now uh, we'll uh, again uh, uh, welcome uh, Bharat. And I'll, uh, the next question to Bharat is, uh, what is e-commerce? But as uh, in my introduction, I said I understood A to D e-commerce. Now uh, I'm asking you, what is e-commerce? Can you just throw light on what is e-commerce? Uh, thank you, Kola, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks uh, uh, to the Bangalore branch. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, for giving us uh, this opportunity to share our thoughts uh, on uh, uh, this uh, new but uh, very interesting uh, uh, piece of legislation. Uh, thank you, Kota sir, for uh, uh, being the driving force for all of this. And it's been a privilege to work with Kota sir, uh, Narendra and uh, Sachin sir and uh, share thoughts. Uh, so now that uh, we've had a, a very uh, uh, deep uh, background, so to say, on the uh, equalization levy provisions, we come to the main parts of the uh, equalization levy provisions, particularly EL 2.0, uh, which uh, uh, is how uh, Kota sir has briefed these new provisions. Interestingly, uh, so uh, the question which Kota sir has is what is e-commerce? So there, uh, 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 interestingly, e-commerce is uh, not defined under these uh, uh, equalization levy provisions. Uh, was section 165A starts with uh, 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 saying that uh, there will be a charge of equalization levy on e-commerce supply of services, but it does not define the word e-commerce, uh, which is very interesting because there are definitions for the other parts of the uh, law. And uh, for this most elementary word, we do not have a definition in, uh, in uh, these equalization levy provisions. So where do we go to uh, understand uh, these, uh, this uh, uh, particular word? Uh, so uh, our first recourse would be to uh, section 194O, which would actually be effective from uh, 1st of October 2020, uh, later uh, uh, end of this uh, month. Um, uh, why, we're, why are we going to section 194O? Uh, that is because uh, the equalization levy provisions themselves specifically mention that uh, if there are any words uh, uh, which are not defined uh, in these provisions, but uh, if they are defined under the Income Tax Act, the meanings as assigned under the Income Tax Act uh, uh, ought to be considered. Uh, so if we go to 194O, there uh, we have a definition of e-commerce uh, in explanation A. Uh, what does that definition uh, say? That definition says e-commerce means supply of goods or services or both. Uh, I'll repeat, supply of goods or services or both, including digital products, all right? including digital products over a digital or electronic network. So just to quickly uh, run through that definition again, e-commerce means supply of goods or services or both, including digital products over a digital or electronic network. So this is a fairly very widely uh, 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 defined uh, uh, idea, uh, well accepted idea as well. So this, uh, this definition of e-commerce is in sync with uh, what the OECD has uh, mentioned in Action Plan 1. Uh, the OECD in Action Plan 1 has mentioned uh, defined e-commerce as the sale or purchase of goods or services conducted over computer networks by methods specifically designed for the purpose of receiving or placing of the orders. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have uh, 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 the, uh, the GST law, which defines uh, uh, e-commerce in a similar manner. The GST law in 244, section 2, uh, clause 44, defines e-commerce along similar lines, like how uh, uh, it is defined in 194O. 
meaning the supply of goods or services or both, including digital products or digital or electronic networks. So basically, the definitions under 194O and uh, uh, the uh, CGST Act are identical, so to say, uh, and uh, very comprehensive as well. Uh, so this sets actually the scope of these provisions. So uh, as we go further and understand what is e-commerce operator, e-commerce supply or service, we should never ever forget the meaning of e-commerce. It's extremely wide. It means supply of goods or services or both, including digital products over digital or uh, electronic network. Now, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, GST practitioners or uh, uh, WAT practitioners will be very uh, sensitive uh, uh, the intense debate, which the words goods, the words services themselves uh, used to. Play. So, uh, whether software constitutes goods, whether electricity constitutes goods, uh, that was a matter of intense debate under the uh, G uh, GST law. Now, uh, that, that debate is also going to come up uh, uh, in the uh, context of equalization. Maybe. What are goods? What are services? Again, services are not ever uh, uh, defined in the equalization levy provisions. However, we have the equalization levy provisions uh, uh, referring back to 194, which talk about what are services. So there's going to be some debate on what are goods, what are services, what are digital products as well. So uh, if we have an ebook, that would typically constitute a digital product. Uh, but uh, uh, what about your, uh, uh, say, internet facility itself? Whether the internet facility itself constitutes, and, and if I subscribe to an internet facility online, I just go to the Airtel website or some other uh, internet service provider's website, I subscribe to it online. Whether that itself is an e-commerce activity, which uh, which comes within the purview of equalization, maybe, et cetera, we'll debate that later. But e-commerce, very, very widely defined, goods, services, digital products, and uh, we have the field open for uh, uh, a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, well, Bharat, uh, while uh, defining or explaining what is e-commerce, you were uh, talking, you were mentioning about e-commerce operator. Let me also uh, pose a question. Who is an e-commerce operator? Can you throw some light on this uh, aspect also? Of course. So, uh, the, uh, the word e-commerce operator, another interesting phrase, uh, uh, very uh, elaborately defined under the equalization levy provisions uh, itself. Uh, again, this concept of e-commerce e operator is also found in the uh, GST law. Uh, so let's just uh, see what uh, uh, the equalization levy provisions talk about on e-commerce operator. So they define e-commerce operator, first of all, to mean a non-resident. So that e-commerce operator means a non-resident. So no residents are covered under the e-commerce operator definition under EL 2.0. E-commerce operator means a resident who owns operates or manages digital or electronic facility or platform for online sale of goods or online provision of services or both. So basically there are four parts to this definition. The first part is the non-resident. So the e-commerce operator should be a non-resident. Secondly, he should operate or own, operate or manage a digital or electronic facility or platform. Own, operate, man manage. So the owner could be somebody, the operator or manager could be somebody. All right. And what, what should the owner operate? They should owner operate a digital or electronic facility. Again, this phrase digital or electronic facility itself is extremely wide. Uh, they use the word facility very nicely. So this uh, concept of uh, facility uh, has been uh, 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 under a lot of uh, uh, discussion and debate uh, from a very long time. So in the context of uh, 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 telephone charges. We had the ruling of the Madras High Court uh, in the case of Skyset, uh, where uh, 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 the department had sought to uh, say that uh, uh, payment of telephone bills, telephone charges, uh, is subject to uh, the levy of uh, is subject to withholding tax under 194J. That's when the Madras High Court said that no, this is a standard facility. It's not a payment of a payment for services. It's a standard facility. Uh, and any person who's willing to pay that sum uh, would be given the service. So this not ought to be uh, brought under 194J. Now, uh, 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 the, uh, it appears that the legislature uh, has uh, uh, learned a lot from there. And uh, they actually factored in this concept of facility. And again, of course, the inspiration has been the uh, Act Action Plan 1 report and the lot of, uh, and the whole lot of intelligence in the 2016 equalization uh, uh, levy committee report, 
and uh, thereafter a lot of guidance from the uh, OECD itself on this uh, whole idea, uh, wherein they have brought in the concept of digital or electronic facility or the platform itself. So we had this discussion of platform as a service. So even a platform is covered uh, under uh, these provisions. Again, all of this, the owning, operating, managing of all these platforms and facilities should be for online sale of goods or online provision of services or both. Only if all of these four categories are satisfied, four, uh, yeah, four categories are satisfied, would that person, would that non-resident actually become an e-commerce operator? Unless these conditions are satisfied, a, a non-resident will not become an e-commerce operator. So we have had these questions as to a lot of uh, 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 services would be provided by the parent, uh, by, by the subsidiary company in India to the parent company. Uh, and uh, all of that would happen electronically. The question was whether uh, uh, the, the, the uh, non-resident, for whatever reason, the non-resident uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, exigible to equalization. Really. That the question to be answered is whether that parent company is an e-commerce e e e operator. So as long as the uh, parent is not engaged in operating a digital uh, or electronic uh, facility or platform for the purpose of online sale of online sale or online provision of goods or services, they will not constitute an e-commerce operator. So I hope that helps. So well, uh, uh, well uh, Bharat, you said uh, about uh, the e-commerce operator, a uh, person who owns a platform or who manages a platform or operates a platform. Okay. So there may be a situation where uh, there are two non-residents. One uh, owns a platform, another operates a platform. Both assume both of them are non-residents. Yes. Uh, will there be a case of double taxation? That is uh, taxing both of them, uh, or uh, how is it? How it works? Sure, uh, sure. So um, uh, uh, let's actually take a simple example and see whether actually double taxation is there. So first, we have an uh, uh, have the owner of a platform. Uh, the owner of a platform licenses the uh, management of the platform to another non-resident, A and B, say. A is the owner, B is the uh, operator or manager. And B is the operator or manager. Uh, he uh, is engaged in online uh, sale of goods to, say, uh, customers in India. Uh, in that situation, uh, 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 how would the equalization EL 2.0 pan out? In this case, the consideration which this uh, uh, B that is the ma uh, manager or uh, uh, operator of the platform, the consideration which he derives is what would be sought to be exigible to equalization levy 2.0. On the other hand, on the license of the platform by the owner to the operator, typically, uh, at best a license fee or right to use that platform, a payment for a right to use of the platform is what is particularly given. Again, now uh, 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 look at the interplay. B is engaging with Indian restraints, but A and B are non restraints so there are different clauses which of the equalization levy provisions which get triggered at each level on the, at the first instance the uh, the operator and the uh, uh, indian customer on that level yes there would be an equalization levy which has to be paid by b on the other hand uh, the payment by b to a for right to use that platform may typically not be within the ambit of el 2.0 that is because el 2.0 there does not actually uh, actually visualizes Transactions only in relation to either sale of data or sale of advertising. There, those are the only two transactions which are visualized under EL uh, 2.0. So in this simplistic example, there would typically not be equal EL 2.0 triggering on that transaction. Again, if there are more facts which, which do come up, these are the tests which we need to apply to see if EL 2.0 actually triggers. But in this simplistic example, there should typically not be EL 2.0 on the first limb and therefore potentially no double taxation, so to say. So like EL 2 says, uh, like uh, e-commerce operation means sale of goods or services by non-resident to resident. So in your example, you are saying uh, both A and B are non-residents. So when A is uh, supplying some services to B, B being a non-resident, EL 2 will not be applicable. Yes. Right? So, right. but uh, when I go to section 9, Yes. Where uh, uh, if you consider that as a royalty or fees for technical services yes. made by non-resident to non-resident and these yes. services are used by the non-resident for earning a business uh, income in yes. India, then that will be subject to royalty. So there is a yes. different, uh, different uh, view for that. Then uh, maybe he has to do 
withholding taxation considering there is a royal tier fees for taxation exactly right. so there we have yeah. the play of nine coming in again the non residents could again take recourse to a treaty uh, and there has yeah. been a lot of litigation around this issue as well so that would the throw up an interesting dimension so yeah now again once again i welcome uh, sachin uh, for his physical uh, virtual presence uh, here is your next question sachin uh, this is your uh, question for you sachin yeah yeah yes please yeah. so i think after understanding what is e-commerce and uh, the e-commerce operator and also understanding about the legislature uh, the legislation of uh, equation levy now i'll ask you the next question what is uh, e-commerce supply or service yeah um, uh, they, and, uh, and of course uh, they say in uh, the definition they talk about supply of goods supply of service and also usage of uh, ip address in india something that somewhere in the provisions they say ip address in india you can also tell uh, what is the relevance of this ip address in india and how all uh, it can be uh, used or uh, misused also yeah, yeah. what do you say yeah in fact uh, if you look at e-commerce uh, uh, supply or services it is defined in uh, section 164 cb of uh, the finance act right and um, this uh, e-commerce uh, supply of uh, e-commerce uh, uh, supply or services uh, it is defined uh, to mean it's an online sale of goods owned by e-commerce operator or it is online provision of services provided by e-commerce operator or online sale of goods or provision of services both facilitated by e-commerce operator or any combination of these activities is what has been defined uh, as a e-commerce supply or services but what is interesting is uh, i think bharat was mentioning about uh, uh, um, you know cgi uh, the, the definition of e-commerce that is that is defined in uh, cgst act which is quite simple compared to the e-commerce supply or services here under cgst if you look at uh, e-commerce uh, definition it means that supply of goods or services or both including digital products over digital or electronic network so as long as it happens uh, over digital or electronic networks i think you know it will be e-commerce as far as uh, gst is concerned so therefore uh, you know whether product is uh, whether the uh, you know you you uh, you place an order on the e-commerce uh, portal and uh, the delivery happens uh, you know some services you get out there is one such thing where you know it satisfies uh, the e-commerce uh, levy uh, there is also a possibility under gst that uh, you know you you place an order on a e-commerce portal and then supply happens uh, you know or uh, physical supply happens uh, uh, to your doorstep you know that is also uh, gets covered under gst but interestingly if you look at e-commerce supply or services as far as el is concerned um you know it says online sale of goods owned by e-commerce operator so the trigger point uh, here would be uh, you know uh, to it has to come under e-commerce supply or services and that supply or services online sale of goods owned by e-commerce operator and uh, you know how is that uh, this uh, sale uh, e-commerce uh, supply or services how is this sale get consummated so is it that uh, you know you you provide that services uh, online uh, you know you have placed an order so therefore uh, equalization levy is uh, applicable because if uh, just mere placing an order on the um, you know platform i don't think you know the sale is concluded there because for it to be uh, you know triggering equalization levy there has to be online sale of goods owned by uh, you know e-commerce operator so therefore then while the intention appears to be of the legislator to say that anything that happens sale or purchase sale purchase sale happens over or a platform e-commerce platform it, their intention seem to be to cover that but then if you look at uh, the way it is uh, worded now i think while it gets covered under gst but uh, unfortunately it may not get covered under uh, e-commerce uh, supply services because when you say that uh, when it gets triggered the sale you know and for that we may have to uh, you know simply go into the definition of uh, um, you know uh, we can look into the definition of uh, sale of goods act and in the sale of goods act i mean of course there are various aspects that we can uh, look into it 
in the sale of goods act uh, in a, uh, where uh, when when is it get uh, when the con uh, sale gets concluded it is upon delivery of the goods right and so therefore where the uh, order is placed on the platform just by mere placing the order you know sale is not concluded because the order is placed there after the payment happens there is a possibility the payment may get through or may not get through and ultimately if it gets through then the, the delivery happens uh, uh, at the doorstep physical delivery so is uh, this physical delivery which happens where the sale gets concluded upon physical delivery you think uh, that uh, you know that is covered under uh, this e-commerce supply or services to my mind it would be quite challenging to uh, take that particular proposition having said that but uh, intention of the legislator to my mind appears to be that uh, they wanted to cover both but i think uh, it uh, this this definition what they have given falls a little short of uh, the intention of the legislature over to you okay uh, now uh, we will uh, just move to the next uh, aspect uh, i'll just ask this question to pose this question to narendra what is the charge for equation levy uh, consideration like whether it is on uh, net basis or gross basis can you just explain yeah again uh... e commerce uh, because in e commerce transactions uh, as we know like uh, one person may own and one person may operate so there will be uh, there, are, there will be transactions where uh, you will book a order with one uh, e commerce uh, operator but he may not uh, supply the goods. Some other person may supply the goods, but we'll be paying for both the things. So in that context, just let us explain uh, whether yeah. it will be on a cross basis or net basis. I will uh, uh, take it up from where uh, Sachin left and uh, also try to supplement what he has said and then go into 165 capital A because there is an interplay between 165 capital A and the definition of e-commerce supply or services. So both of these things go together. Uh, if you look at 165 capital A, the uh, the charge is on the consideration received or receivable by an e-commerce operator from e-commerce supplier services. So anything which is after 1st April 2020, the equalization levy shall be charged at 2% and the charge is on the consideration. So what are the important aspects here? One is the consideration received or receivable. Second is who is the e-commerce operator, which Bharat explained. Third is from e-commerce supply or services. So the words used are e-commerce supply or services made or provided or facilitated. To understand these three terms, we need to go back to the definition of e-commerce supply or services itself, which is defined in 164. Now, as Sachin explained, the e-commerce supply or services, and my view here are possibly uh, uh, diametrically opposite to uh, what uh, Sachin Sir's views are. And, and this is also the idea to have different views in a panel discussion that the e-commerce supplier services means, so it's an exhaustive definition, online sale of goods owned by the e-commerce operator. That's the first category, online uh, sale of goods owned by the e-commerce operator. Second says online provision of services by the e-commerce operator, online provision of services provided by the e-commerce operator. Third category says online sale of goods or provision of services or both facilitated by e-commerce operator. And fourth is the combination of these. So we will keep the fourth uh, uh, clause apart uh, aside for a moment and look at the first three clauses and then apply this to 165 capital A. The 165 capital A has a said it talks of e-commerce supplier services made, provided or facilitated. Now the way I would read it is it would say the online sale of goods made online provision of services provided and the and online sale of goods or provision of services facilitated. So we need to read 165 capital A, three parts of 165 capital A made, provided and facilitated. Now apply this to consideration. So when you talk of sale of goods, the consideration in sale of goods is the value what you get for sale. So for this uh, rupees 100 for a particular item, then 100 rupees is the consideration for sales made. Now if you talk of the e-commerce business models, marketplace business model, which would be uh, clause three of definition of e-commerce supplier services, where it says that the online uh, sale of goods or provision of services facilitated by e-commerce operator. Now his consideration is only for facilitation. So the consideration under 165 capital A should be for facilitation what he is doing. 
So if you take Amazon's example, where it sells the goods owned by someone else, which is hosted on its website, and it gets 20 rupees and 80 rupees is given to the actual owner of the good. Now, Amazon is the e-commerce operator who will fall in clause three of definition of uh, e-commerce e supplier services because he's facilitating the online sale of goods. Now, the, does, the, does, is there an online sale of goods? Now, if you look at goods sale itself, it's a culmination of many activities. Marketing of a product, placing the products online, then offer, acceptance and offer, contract negotiation, closure of the contract and delivery of the goods. I would feel that the place of sale is not relevant for equalization levy. As I said, that if you look at the uh, the boundary which we have in Income Tax Act in Section 459, if the income should accrue or arise, here there is no concept of accrue or arise. There is a concept whether whether there is an online sale. Now, if there is an online sale, then equalization levy is attracted. It could be subject to some constitutional issue. That's a different issue. But if there is an online sale of goods, it is attracted. Now, where the uh, uh, sale is happening, where you place an order on, say, Amazon, Alibaba, etc., or in, in the context of services, say, in education services, training videos streamed to you online, in case of Netflix, where the uh, movies or music is streamed to you uh, online, I would feel that in those cases, the word online is still satisfied. Now, the goods you place are online, the tracking of the order happens online. After you deliver, even if you want to return, you still go back online. And therefore, online sale of goods is satisfied. So if you take off example of Section 30 Sale of Goods Act also, assuming that is relevant here, in case of a return, the sale gets completed when the period for return gets completed, sale on return basis. No doubt that act was in 1930 and no one would have visualized something like e-commerce. But then the return is after seven days of delivery, say, for example, the return period is seven days, which may happen when the actually the goods say are returned or the acceptance is happening online. Now, the contract, the transfer of title happens all through a support of online, through a facilitation of online. And the definition of online is so wide that I would feel that online sale of goods, which is happening through the mechanism of these websites, would be covered within the meaning of online. And the consideration where the goods are owned by the e-commerce operator would be the full value of consideration. That would be the charge for 2%. But where the facilitation is only being done by e-commerce operator, in those cases, now the question is, how do you read the consideration? Do you read the consideration for sale of goods or do you read the consideration for facilitation only? I would read 165 capital A to pro say that the consideration is only for facilitation because three words used in 165 capital A made, provided or facilitated refers to three limbs or three clauses of the definition of e-commerce supplier services. So the consideration should be what is the consideration of the e-commerce operator? Now, even 100 rupees is paid to Amazon, it passes on, say, 80 rupees to Dell or someone else in US. In those cases, the consideration for Amazon is only 20 rupees, say, and 80 rupees is the consideration for Dell, and Dell itself may not be actually an e-commerce operator. So, the, what we need to see is what is the consideration for the e-commerce operator and not is the consideration as a whole. So, that would my view that you need to take net basis. Similarly, where there are returns of a goods which are happening, which is very common in this kind of an industry, that will also again have to be evaluated on net basis because if something is returned, that cannot be a consideration. That cannot be a consideration. No doubt the accounting concepts would say that you are accounting it as a sales and then return it as a sales returns. That's a different, uh, that's the only way of accounting it. But legally, when there was a right to return a good, the, the product or the title in the goods were never transferred to the buyer. Therefore, it is ne never a sale in a legal sense. It might be a sales in an accounting sense for levy of GST, etc., but it is never a sales in a legal sense is what I would feel. And in those cases, the charge should be on net basis or on the after considering the return. In case of services, services which are provided online. Here, again, there could be situation where something is provided offline, something is provided online, there's a composite supply. In those cases, you need to break up the consideration into appropriate methodologies to say what is the consideration for online services and give some meaning to the phrase online rendering of uh, online rendering of services. Another aspect that comes into the 165 capital A is the uh, uh, is is the uh, exclusions which are there, which will come into play for the purpose if it is already covered under 165. That means if it is an EL1 item, it won't come in EL2. 
Second, if the non-resident e-commerce operator has a PE in India, he would not be covered here. And if the sales turnover is less than 2 crore, he would not be covered on 165 capital A. In those cases, the consideration or the charge would not be triggered in those aspects. What I would feel is that we need to understand that the, the different business models, the different clauses of e-commerce supply and services try to cover different business models where there is a sale. It could be the owner, the person could be the owner of goods and he is doing the sales. Provision of services, for example, online services, maybe of live streaming, etc. Facilitation are mostly the aggregators like uh, in the Indian context, we can call it as Uber or someone else, where the facilitation is happening through online mechanism, services are through offline mechanism. Those are what would be covered within the meaning of uh, uh, these. In cases where this is not happening, for example, if the tickets are booked online, but the services are offline. Here, there is no, actually, there is no online service. In those cases, should not be covered within the ambit of 165 capital A. Charge is what I would feel. Last point I would like to make here is the uh, extended scope of 165 capital A. We will also address that in uh, as we go forward. That's the transaction between non resident to non resident, where there's a data collection happening in India and advertisement which are targeted to the customers in India. So, this would be the broad outline of the understanding of the consideration and the charge under 165 capital A. Well, uh, uh, just to just yeah. one more point before I conclude, uh, the meaning yeah. of services and meaning of goods mm -hmm. is not defined in uh, the statute. And just these four things, sale, goods, provision and services, given that they are not defined, this would lead to a lot of litigation. In the context of goods, the definition under Article 366.12, goods includes all material, commodity, and articles could be relevant. The, the challenge or the risk could be the definition of services, which is there in Article 366.26, sub-Article 26A. And that is a dangerous definition. Services mean anything other than goods. So if you take that definition, services means anything other than goods, which is similar to the definition under 202 uh, subsection 102 of CGST Act, which also says services means anything other than goods. So effectively, the levy of EL will be so wide, either it will fall in goods or it will fall in services. The question is the services should still be online provision of services, but the ambit would be much wider if we take that meaning of services uh, in the context of definition of ESS or in the context of uh, the definition of uh, or the charge under 165 capital M. Uh, uh, us, uh, just uh, yeah. one, one aspect I would like to supplement what uh, um, Narendra mentioned, of course, uh, the aspect of uh, that uh, net, uh, uh, you know, the EL on a net basis is what uh, is he mentioned about. So while uh, while it is, uh, I agree with that particular view, but also there is a possibility which view is, uh, I think, uh, is restricted to when we do it on a uh, person who is facilitating this online services, for example, Amazon or things like that. For example, if I'm if I'm directly placing an order on let's say uh, furniture manufacturer uh, they are outside india and uh, you know, or some services that they are uh, uh, rendering which is uh, directly from uh, the, the service provider not through the intermediary then possibly the the concept of uh, gross will kick in there instead yes. of net so this is yes. one aspect i thought i'll supplement yeah. Yes, even if someone is having, uh, it's a standalone website also, like a Dell or a furniture manufacturer, he is having his own website from where the customers can place the orders. In those cases, the cross basis and he, the suppose the Dell has a website through which you are placing these orders and there is an online platform through which you are doing it. The Dell itself could become an e-commerce operator. So entire consideration will be liable for EL, which is a very good point highlighted by Sachin sir. This is something which we should also keep it in mind because the definition is, uh, online platform, uh, I mean, th those words are very wide uh, and it could in fact cover uh, not necessarily the marketplace models or uh, one kind of Amazon or Flipkart, but it would, it would also cover individual companies which are having their own uh, websites or platforms through which the transactions are happening. Okay, uh, Narendra and uh, Sachin. Now uh, let me uh, ask Bharat if he wants to add something or I can uh, proceed to the next query, next question. Bharat, would you like to uh, add yes. something to this? Yeah, I had uh, one point. Uh, this uh, came as a thought uh, just as uh, Narendra was uh, wrapping up uh, his uh, mention on how Dell uh, or uh, some such uh, similar uh, model uh, could trigger. Uh, uh, this is just a thought. Uh, 
uh, the provisions i was just wondering are the provisions so widely worded that they would uh, uh, they would uh, factor this situation as well uh, this uh, there is the indian uh, subsidiary and uh, there is there is uh, its parent company outside india they are engaged in uh, uh, distributing uh, say some certain products in india which the indian subsidiary uh, procures from the parent company and then uh, uh, sells in india he, the indian subsidiary is a distributor of products now all of this activity happens through email and through the uh, company's sap uh, or erp uh, system uh, uh, would this also now the consideration is paid by the indian entity indian subsidiary to the foreign parent it's a typical transaction of sale of goods now all of this is happening through the sap platform pursuant to a larger intercompany agreement which they have had so now uh, the thought which came to my mind was whether this whether in this circumstance the parent company constitutes an e-commerce operator so just to just to read that definition again which i uh, ran through in the, at the start means a non resident so our parent company is a non resident who owns operates or manages a digital or electronic facility or platform so they operate that sap erp facility for online sale of goods or online provision of services so it's not your amazon or flipkart kind of a model but within the group for transactions of goods they use that facility would this also get covered within the ambit of equalization we was a thought which i had again is there an online sale of goods owned by the e-commerce operator yes that condition is satisfied uh, so i was just wondering this uh, these transactions which in the earlier context uh, pre equalization ab 2.0 would simply be outside the ambit of indian income tax would this also get covered this is a question i have i, I mean i mean uh, this part came just as uh, narendra was wrapping up his uh, uh, his mentions um, so uh, i just uh, uh, leave this part there and if you can take it up we can take it up yeah i i just uh, maybe a small comment on that uh, if you go by the plain language uh, there is nothing which says that the facility or platform should be for public or should be for order by general public uh, but we will have to somewhere apply the mischief rule of interpretation and see for what purpose uh, this law has been brought in and what was the context in which it was brought in and there is a good amount of literature before us today to say in what context it was brought in it is majorly to uh, attack b2c transactions which were happening and where there was a virtual presence data was being mined and lot of such things and there the 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 mischief rule would try to say that where the platform or facility is for public purposes that is somewhere we'll have to read down the law we'll we'll have to go away from literal reading and go and say that applying the mischief rule if this is for a general public it is for general consumption purposes in those cases only this law should be applied in other cases where there are internal erp systems where you trigger the orders internally on your group companies on your uh, service providers on your vendors and the parts are supplied say for example for manufacturing those cases should ideally be kept out of uh, this levy applying the principles of mischief rule otherwise the levy would be so wide that it would cover each and every transaction of import each and every transaction of import of goods or import of services so somewhere some line will have to be drawn keeping the theoretical background keeping the mind in the uh, context in which this provisions have been brought in literal interpretation will have to be read down read down somewhere to bring in that interpretation into uh, uh, into this uh, well uh, narendra the next question i have to uh, continue with this uh, discussion like uh, there is something called uh, telemarketing or uh, placing orders through emails uh, like uh, if there are uh, purchase of goods or getting some services through phone calls or emails whether uh, the applicability of uh, equation levy will be there on these transactions also this question is for uh, bharat bharat can answer this question sure sir bharat? yeah yeah uh, so uh, whether uh, uh transactions or sales or provision of services concluded over emails and uh, uh, phone calls would they uh, come within the ambit again just to take off from where uh, narendra left uh, on the uh, previous example uh well, were these kind of transactions uh, via emails phone calls were these uh, sought to be taxed by uh, em 2.0 uh, that was the elementary question 
uh, again uh, uh, having said that uh, if we go to the uh, bare provisions uh, uh, like narendra discussed e commerce supply of services means online sale of goods what is online online uh, uh, means a facility or service or right or benefit or access that is obtained through the internet or any other form of digital or communication network so if we look at emails if we look at phone calls all of these happen through the digital or telecommunication network so uh, a literal reading of the provisions all right would throw up this absurdity that even email uh, 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 email or phone call sales phone based sales these could be subject to equalization levy but as rightly mentioned by uh, narendra is this the mischief which which uh, uh, year 2.0 was sought to remedy was this the purpose of uh, 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 action plan 1 was this the purpose of uh, the uh, equalization uh, uh, levy committee report uh, in that backdrop uh, uh, my answer would be no but then uh, given the law is what it says uh, uh, it's inevitable that uh, for the time being we read that as yes it would trigger and this is where uh, one would hope for a clarification from the government or uh, maybe a representation from the industry associations to clarify this aspect uh, uh, so that uh, this very critical and very fundamental issue is 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 uh, given uh, quite as to so what do you yeah uh, well bharat sir you are yeah i i would like just to add to this uh, yeah. what bharat said is because it's a much online is uh, the the way the online is defined it would really throw up a lot of challenges uh, but there is one aspect that one could argue from this position uh, based on literal interpretation the way bharat put it uh, would surely be there but there could be something we can think of and try to defend this to say that the e-commerce operator should own manage and online facility or a network digital network right it should have a dig digital electronic facility or platform own operates or manage now when i place an order on email suppose i has a person place an order on email i have a gmail account and place an order on email and which is received by a non resident he is non resident managing or having an uh, online facility or platform is it an electronic facility or platform is it his own is he managing that email services suppose i do it on gmail who is managing gmail it's the google which is managing gmail i am not managing that i am not neither owner of that facility i am neither an operator of that facility i am neither a manager of those facilities same if a phone call is made on say telephone so whether i am a i am am i am operating that facility am i am owning that facility or managing those facility so possibly there one could argue that the the transaction is the the person the non resident is not an e-commerce operator is not an e-commerce operator that could be one argument to save uh, these kind of transactions uh, from the ea uh, uh narendra you said that that when you so you are dealing with a telephone that he is not an operator of course uh, he doesn't own that particular tele uh, telecommunication licenses as such say suppose if you have a bsnl connection or any other connection as such using that we are operating so will that amount to operation am I, of uh, am i operating my own system on my own phone or the network not the the, the e-commerce operator definition says owns operates or manages digital or electronic facility or platform just whether okay. my system or laptop is a facility or platform i would feel no it is the network or facility or platform is much wider where it can be accessed by many people so if i have the word facility for example i have a huge server setup where uh, cloud cloud services are given then that could be a facility if i talk of a platform amazon website possibly is a platform where huge amount of data can be loaded products can be loaded but if if it is on my own system that possibly in my opinion may not be in facility or platform it is just a device it is just a device and have i made an online sale or have i only transmitted an online order so when i send a po through online or when i place an order for goods through email facility i have only transmitted an order i have not done an online sale is possible way of looking at uh, uh, this uh, uh, this position situation okay uh now moving on to the next question like uh, whenever uh, we are talking about uh, e-commerce service e-commerce operator 
many places we talk about services. So when we talk about services, services are not defined under uh, this particular equation levy legislation as such or the act itself. Bharat, can you tell me what is the meaning of uh, services? Can we borrow this uh, meaning of services from the Income Tax Act, say under section 194J or 195? Or is it restricted only to those services defined under uh, these sections or beyond that? Sure. Uh, uh, so like uh, uh, Narendra mentioned, uh, services, uh, uh, the, that word is not defined in the equalization review provision, EL 2.0. Uh, does not contain any definition of services. So uh, let's go back to 194 in uh, the basis of the uh, residuary uh, meaning clause uh, in the EL uh, 2.0. Uh, how are services defined? Services are defined interestingly you now. Services are defined as as an inclusive in an inclusive manner. Services include fees for technical services and fees for professional services as defined in the explanation of section 194J. So now the definition under 194O has simply broadened the scope of services. So initially, uh, in the context of 194J and uh, 917, we used to look at uh, fees for technical services uh, to mean uh, uh, fees for managerial, uh, technical, or consulting services. And uh, for professional services, we, we used to refer to the list of uh, specified professions to control whether uh, uh, payment is subject to TDS. And that was the restricted scope of services on which tax uh, lay, uh, withholding tax uh, obligations were prescribed. Now, services have been dis uh, defined in an inclusive manner. So now, there is no limit to what we cannot call services. It is unfortunate that we now we need to look back into what, uh, like uh, Narendra was mentioning, do we go back to the GST law and see what they define as services. Again, services are defined in, uh, the, we should not be going, but it's interesting to see where we will end up when services are de defined in an inclusive manner. It's a very wide field. How wide is the field? Let's see uh, one example or rather one glimpse is given by the GST Act, the CGST Act uh, plus 102 of section two. It means uh, services there, it's given a very uh, 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 exhaustive definition. Services mean anything other than goods, money and securities, but include activities relating to the use of money or its conversion by cash or any other mode, etc. And, and, and there, there is another part. So what does it mean? Anything other than goods, money or securities, but includes something extremely wide, extremely wide. So, uh, uh, for example, if uh, 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 there, there is this activity that um, uh, I log into, say, a website similar to ICICI securities, and uh, if I uh, uh, subscribe, I mean purchase securities, purchase a foreign company securities from that website, and I make a commission payment to to um, uh, the the ICI securities uh, kind of a vendor, it that commission, which or that facilitation, so to say, would now get covered under services. All right. Earlier, I could still take this plea that these are not technical services, these are not professional services. Or I could take this plea that something similar to a standard facility, like what the Supreme Court mentioned in Kotak Securities and was affirmed in Bharti Cellular. Uh, if there is a, there is technology used to provide a facility upon payment, that's that would not constitute services for the purpose of 194J, and that is a standard facility. We can no longer take recourse to those principles because services now, in light of 194O, which inevitably uh, would be the right uh, uh, place to see the see for the definition of services. They are defined in a very inclusive manner. Anything other than goods would come in. Uh, again, uh, uh, now what are goods? What are services? Again, that the debate is inevitably going to come. Fortunately, we have digital products which would give a quietus to all of these matters. But then, uh, depending on facts, the, this is going to steer a hornet's nest. Yes, sir. Well, Parat, uh, well, Parat, I'll take an example now. Yes. Like you know, as you said, that uh, some of the services cover beyond this uh, fees for technical services or fees for professional services. Yes. This, of course, not uh, now. Maybe after this uh, COVID thing and all uh, comes down, uh, maybe the uh, people start moving out of this country or move, moving out of the state or also. Or now I can say a few people moving out of their homes also. I yes. think there is a situation where. Uh, uh, a person wants to visit some other place outside India. So he will sit in his uh, place uh, in India and he will book his uh, travel tickets uh, using some uh, 
network or uh, operator outside India, he will book uh, uh, what you call a hotel there, hotel stay there, and he will book other uh, whatever facilities or recreation you would like to uh, enjoy when he is uh, going there out of uh, country. So, are there any exemptions provided uh, for specific uh, services like this, like hospitality services, travel services? Uh, if you have anything like that, anyone of you can uh, let me know. Are there any exemptions or even these uh, services are covered under uh, the circulation level? Yes, sir. unfortunately, as of now, there is no uh, list of excluded services. We just have to go back to the definition, see whether they are goods or services, and uh, proceed to uh, uh, look at the applicability of uh, EL 2.0. Having said that, uh, uh, there is only the uh, turnover threshold, uh, uh, which I guess you'll be taking up later. Apart from the th turnover threshold, uh, unfortunately, as of today, there is no uh, specific exemption. Of, uh, exemption. So what I gave the examples, uh, you according to you, it also covers so like uh, that is also come, uh, coming under the uh, e-commerce uh, services yes. and the e-commerce. Yes. Okay, next uh, moving on to the next type of uh, example. Next example I'll take. So in case of uh, Netflix or Amazon, uh, where uh, we we pay a fees for uh, subscription, like where subscription fees are paid by person resident in India, and the subscriber gets only the viewership rights. Like we know in uh, Netflix or Amazon, if you can subscribe for one yearly subscription or uh, a monthly subscription, the viewership will be having some eligibility or uh, or you can just go and view certain uh, shows or movies as such. Narendra, my question to you is whether these type of uh, fees paid, that subscription fees paid, attracts equation level. Yeah. So here, um, uh, in here, these are uh, very specific services in this question. Uh, if you see the equalization levy report of 2016, one of the uh, uh, points which the report had very specifically pointed out quite few times in the report is that the charge under equalization levy should be very specific. The list of services that should be provided should be very specific. And that is what they have even given the list of services which they wanted to cover under EL1. Also, the point was very clearly made. Do not have a broad based uh, definition because that will lead to a lot of litigation and chaos. EL1 very well implemented that advice from the committee and very specifically said what they want to cover. No doubt there were some gray areas there also, but otherwise it was broadly very clear that what they wanted to cover, the advertisement part, was very specifically listed out in the EL1. That is why possibly in last four years we have not seen any litigation, at least the reported litigation on the EL1. But when it came to EL2, that advice of the committee was not considered and a very broad definition has been drafted. That is what even Bharat highlighted, the definition of service. It is so wide that anything could fall within that ambit. Only saving grace could be that the provision of service should be online. It says online provision of services provided by e-commerce operator. Now, if the provisions, the services are not provided online, there is a possibility to argue that it is not covered within the ambit. So if the services are offline, only the online portion possibly will get triggered. Uh, for the example, like a movie, uh, movie thing. Now, in a case of a movie where the streaming is happening online. The Netflix could classify as an e-commerce operator. Amazon Prime could classify as an e-commerce operator. And the service of streaming is can be taken as a service. Now, question is whether the streaming is, is a service or is it a facility? Or under the EL, service is so wide that even it will cover the standard facility. I would feel under EL, the service is so wide that you to even cover the standard facility. Next question is to whom are we making a payment? Is the e-commerce operator the non-resident? Generally, there are two businesses which could come into picture where the foreign e-commerce operator who is running the streaming services has a subsidiary in India who can further distribute this to the uh, Indian consumers. So, for example, Netflix Netherlands can have a Netflix India subsidiary which keeps its uh, arm's length margin and then the subscriptions are sold by the Netflix India entity. In those cases, when the consumers make payment to Netflix India, for example, that would not be liable for EL for the reason that the Indian entity is a an resident. But if the Indian consumers directly make payment to say Netflix Netherlands, then the Netflix Netherlands would get classified as e-commerce operator. The service 
will be covered as online provision of service. Assuming the meaning of service includes a facility, standard facility, and the EL2 will be triggered. In the first example, which I gave that there is a subsidiary in India, for example. Now, the subsidiary, the consumers make payment to the subsidiary, and the subsidiary makes an onward payment to the uh, uh, to the Netherlands entity, for example, Netflix Netherlands. Say, Indian, in Netflix India makes a payment to Netflix Netherlands. There, the question would arise whether the payment by Netflix India to Netflix Netherlands, whether that could be classified as equalization levy, because whether it's an online provision of service or whether that will be classified as a royalty, because there is a license which has been given viewership license for further sub distribution by the Netflix India. Uh, this EL2 in those these kind of cases also gives a opportunity to planning because now because the definition of service is so wide earlier what could fall within the meaning of FTS and royalty could be be falling within the meaning of service and from 10% or whatever the rate could have been applicable in those cases may move to 2%. In my view when these kind of payments are going there is a possibility of argument that the payment from Netflix India to Netflix Netherlands is payment for an online provision of service. Someone could argue that the provision is not for Indian company, but for the direct consumers. But if you keep that, that that could be an argument. But otherwise, the payment from Netflix India could, which is going to Netflix Netherlands, could be liable for uh, EL2. But in case of direct payments, there is no doubt that it could qualify as uh, a service, online provision of service, and EL2 would be applicable. Netflix, uh, uh, such, uh, uh, Narendra, Narendra, yeah. Narendra add, uh, just to add one more question, uh, query to your uh, whatever your explanation. You said uh, Netflix uh, Indian subsidiary is making payment to Netflix uh, Netherlands. That can attract uh, equalization levy is what you said. Uh, initially, well, uh, you mentioning you also mentioned that it may also attract uh, like uh, something called a royalty or fees for technical services. Now, if it is a royalty or fee for technical services, then it has to be charged at ten percent. Now, you said it may be levied in the equalization levy. Now, thinking that equalization levy will be there, Netflix India will not uh, deduct TDS at uh, ten percent or uh, considering it as royalty or fees for technical services. Now, whether that amounts that the car problems will uh, attract on uh, Netflix India as such. Um, now, here, I mean, this is a uh, uh, what uh, uh, whether I can move these payments from 10% to 2%, whether it is Netflix kind of payment or other FTS transactions or other royalty transactions. How you would handle this kind of a things? Or uh, 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 here, I would my view would be like this. See, here, there is a Actual conflict between two provisions: one equalization levy and one the FTS royalty definitions. There is a possibility that a particular transaction falls in either equalization levy or FTS royalty. The rate in equalization levy is two percent. Possibly you may not get a credit for royalty FTS. You pay ten percent. Possibly you may get a credit. Those are different things depending on circumstances of each cases. But can I move from ten percent to two percent? Now, if there is a statutory provision, the GAR provisions cannot apply to. Equalization levy. They can apply only to FTS or royalty because GAR provisions apply to transactions of uh, under under the Income Tax Act, not something outside the uh, Income Tax Act. The Equalization Levy Committee also made it very clear that GAR provisions will not apply to equalization levy. The question that the answer here would be that have I misused or abused a provision? I would feel no because 1050. We will leave aside a one-year mismatch which is there. Very specifically say that if a transaction is applicable or liable for equalization levy under Finance Act 2016, for that transaction, income tax is not applicable. In my opinion, the EL provisions will override the Income Tax Act, though, though there are different views on that. But I would feel that first you need to see whether EL is applicable because 1050 is a very specific exemption. There is no such exemption in EL which says that if it is liable for income tax, no EL will be applicable. So if I have to apply both of them, if I apply ones and say that both are applicable, FTS royalty is also applicable and EL is also applicable. Then I come back and say that is it a 1050 exemption available to me? Yes, 1050 exemption is available to me because it is chargeable to EL. And once 1050 exemption is available to me, then the income is exempt 
and when the income is exempt by virtue of a statutory provisions gar cannot be applied gar cannot be applied so there is this risk because of a uh, possibly loop sided drafting of 1050 possibly no clarity in terms of how the provisions should have been there which should have been given preference they could have inserted a provision in el say that services will not include services which are falling in fts or royalty or they could have made a specific provision in the definition of uh, could have inserted a specific definition of services in section 163 of finance act 2016 to say that we are either including only this or we are excluding fts and given that the service the term service is very wide and in those cases if it falls in el it falls in fts i would feel el would take precedence over it uh, is my opinion yeah. okay. However, just to add to what narendra uh, narendra mentioned but let's take a situation uh, narendra suppose if it is uh, been treated as uh, only uh, a fee for a technical services so far, uh, so far and now that after implementation of uh, equalization levy now the ssc uh, would like to move to equalization levy and would like to take the advantage of uh, 2% and uh, then there is a possibility and uh, and because of which there is no income tax on by virtue of invoking this uh, 10th subsection 50 by virtue of that possibly uh, the, 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 you know uh, subject to that uh, three crore limit uh, in gar uh, possibly then uh, still department can try to invoke uh, this class right because considering that uh, earlier year it was uh, fts now because of the gar now this and uh, there is no substantial and one of the main reason of course all those more tainted tests have uh, been uh, you know uh, satisfied and one of the main uh, objectives for tax saving purposes don't you think that will be possibility of a gar being applied possibly that could be the approach of department but the i would say have i abused any provision have i done anything about that it is a statutory provision which has been given to me that you can the income is exempt and that has been implemented from a particular year and once that has been implemented and there is an overriding provision which has been made in my opinion el is overriding income tax act to that extent If, because there is an overriding provision which has been made and the statute itself is pushing it from 10 to 2% i have only used a statutory provision i have not abused or misused okay. any statutory provision could be a possible argument that we could look at uh, possibly they will have to plug this loophole quickly otherwise people will move quickly to 10% to 2% uh, uh, from next year at least when 1050 is triggered at least this current financial year there is a problem because 1050 is not applicable for this current year but has and when this comes in people may start doing this that we are not falling under fts royalty because of a specific exemption the statute gave me an exemption there is no fault of mine and statute itself said that you are have to comply with el and therefore i am going to the el provisions so again you are possibly trying to apply and apply gar for these kind of trans transactions but i would feel that it is a good case to say that el would override income tax act and that would have that should have a precedence yeah over to sir uh well uh, uh uh chairman can we just uh, give a short break of 10 minutes and uh, reassemble what what do you feel chairman chairman or secretary because we can i mean no Chairman, we'll continue. Continue, Kotas. Yes. We'll continue. Yeah, yeah. We'll continue, Kotas. No, no. We'll just uh, take their views. What is that? How to go over? Chairman, are you there? Secretary. Okay. I think none of them are available. we we'll move on to the next question uh like now uh, with this uh, lockdowns being uh, happening uh, most of us are working from home so we got used to work from home like we are uh, giving consultation to the clients and also we are giving uh, we are working from home now there is a situation where uh, we are receiving some consultation uh, whether it is uh, tax consultation or professional opinion through video conferencing from a pro from an on desk whether that uh, that amounts to equalization level this question i will uh, pose to sachin your views on this 
Yeah, if you uh, look at this uh, provision of uh, this professional opinion or professional services, uh, they, in fact, uh, they do fall in the definition of uh, e-commerce supply or services. But the mood factor that we have to look into it, uh, whether such professionals, uh, can they be treated as e-commerce operator? Well, the service is uh, e-commerce uh, supply or services, but, but the, the, the provider of such, such services, is it an e-commerce operator? And which is defined uh, as a non-resident who owns, operates, and manages digital or electronic facility. In this case, the professional, be it a chartered accountant or, or a medical uh, professional, uh, I don't think any one of us, uh, we own or operate uh, or manage any digital or ele electronic facility. So uh, from that uh, uh, perspective, if you look at, uh, you know, the possibility of uh, this uh, you know, online services uh, that is uh, given, uh, you know, may not uh, apply, this uh, legalization levy may not apply to that. However, it's an interesting uh, this thing to see, uh, even for, for that matter, the services what we provide. Besides, uh, let us look at, uh, you know, um, video conferencing, even let us look at email, Yahoo, uh, you know, public domains that we use to uh, to provide services, um, you know, by eBay email services, which has already been discussed earlier. They're saying that, uh, you know, it is not owned by us. So therefore, the, the services through these facilities, it is a standard facility. So therefore, the services through this facility may not uh you know um, the the equalization levy may not be uh, applicable for these uh, kind of uh, situations but however there is an interesting proposition i would like to put it here is that suppose i have uh, my website and uh, i have a bot and uh, many of the questions uh, common questions that are there you know is being uh, answered by that bot so then possibly while the services that is there as i said earlier the providing medical opinion or you know ca opinion uh, maybe a e-commerce uh, supply it falls into the definition but if you use a facility which is not your platform and uh, so for possibly the the platform which we are using now so therefore through that platform which i don't own possibly it may not trigger equalization levy but if i own this platform let us say the website is mine and uh, the, the services that are being asked, you know, I've been able to render those services through bots, let us assume. Yeah, possibly, you know, this kind of a services uh, may therefore uh, partake, uh, e I mean, may uh, this equalization levy uh, may be applicable to these kind of a transaction, which is, uh, of course, we have to, um, uh, you know, analyze this is on a space, uh, case to case basis. Interestingly, this OECD also has discussed about digital transaction done through this digital platform, wherein the transactions are effectuated through digital pl platform, primarily through an automated system, and uh, also about other modes of uh, transactions like this mails, and uh, uh, you know they have uh, given that examples like for catalog shopping and uh, sale through call centers, website displaying the products but uh, routing the customer to call center, all these things. See, in this particular case, OECD has gone ahead to say that although in practice, the, the transactions are less likely to enable business to generate a significant amount of revenue, but um, uh, all the ways the transaction enabling business to engage in sale transaction with, without physical presence in the country of customer, right? It also has mentioned that uh, to ensure that the tax pay player in similar situation carry out similar uh, transaction will be subject to similar level of taxation, it may be preferable to define a factor so as to include all revenues generated by transaction concluded by non-resident enterprise remotely with in-country customers. However, it also says that potential adverse effects associated with such broad scope uh, would in any case be addressed by application of these other factors. So this is broadly what OECD says. But as I said, from uh, my understanding, if uh, the services are uh, provided uh, through a platform which I don't own, uh, equalization levy should not be applicable. But if the platform I own and manage, and uh, through that, if I levy uh, so these professional services, it should, uh, to my mind, uh, apply this equalization levy. So, so what you mean? Yeah. So, Sachin, what you mean to say is like uh, any levy should come that uh, either you should own a platform or uh, manage a, a platform or facilitate a platform. That is the basic yes. uh, condition is what you said. Yes. Now, let me ask you another question. Like, uh, say, suppose there's a parent company 
which is uh, outside India, and it has got a subsidiary company in India. And that subsidiary company is a, assume that it is a it is a PE. So there may be certain services rendered from uh, what do you call this? Some management services uh, rendered by parent company to subsidiary company. Whether that amounts to equalization levy? The first question. And the second question is: Suppose that subsidiary is not a PE, what will be your answer? Will your answer be different? Yeah, obviously. The, see, the minute uh, there is a PE, the question of equalization levy doesn't apply. So you will have to go to Income Tax Act, and then you have to look into the provisions of Income Tax Act if the PE uh, is established in India. Uh, as far as uh, equalization levy is concerned, uh, it attracts only when there is no PE of a non-resident uh, parent company uh, in India. Right. In a situation like this, uh, where uh, in case of intra-group services, uh, as you said, management services provided by parent company to its uh, subco in India, uh, the subject to, uh, I mean, equalization levy, is it applicable? I think we may have to test uh, these things on uh, uh, the principles of uh, this equalization levy. That the first is whether 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 there is an e-commerce uh, supply or services. Second is whether such supply or services are made of uh, provided by e-commerce uh, operator and uh, the third one is whether such supply or services is to be provided to a person resident in india or to a person using ip address located in india or non-resident in a specified circumstances if these are the three tests that we have to look into right so while uh, as i said coming back to the same thing while the services that the management services that they provide could be a service but is the management of providing it through the platform it is owning possibly it may not be the kind of services uh, that it uh, you know uh, hr services were probably it provides or finance services that it provides um, you know it provides it through a platform which is a standard facility right so therefore if it is done through a facility like a standard facility to my mind uh, so therefore such intra group services to my mind, should not apply. Uh, sh this uh, equalization sh uh, levy should not be applicable okay. to such transactions. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, next question, uh, Barar. Like now, uh, since uh, we have uh, been in the lockdown and we have been working from home, it's not that I will physically go to the office and uh, sit in front of your system or access your servers. That is uh, physical servers. Now, uh, most of us uh, may be using this uh, cloud servers. So like uh, cloud servers, or the cloud campus, or cloud for everything. Now we are talking about cloud. So before uh, uh, the separation levy, we are talking about cloud only. So this uh, subscription to cloud server or download of a software to cloud that is from a non-resident, whether this also amounts to e-commerce services and whether it amounts to um, so it is subject to equalization levy. Sure, uh, so this uh, issue of uh, uh, whether payments uh, uh, for accessing cloud servers, payments for downloads of software, that's had a long history of litigation uh, yeah, in our country. Uh, uh, we we see that today there's the uh, this matter of the on on uh, on the software whether it uh, constitutes royalty or not is is still to be decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, in uh, Karnataka, we've had uh, the ruling of the Karnataka High Court in Samsung, which has said that payments for software constitute royalty. Okay. But uh, on the contrary, we had uh, uh, the Delhi High Court in Infrasoft saying that uh, this would not be royalty. This uh, 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 this is akin to sale of goods or uh, fairly uh, off-the-shelf uh, products, and therefore this is not royalty. That's why today we are, uh, this matter is before the Supreme Court. Um, uh, we are yet to uh, uh, the, uh, the matters were heard uh, just before the lockdown and uh, after the lockdown there's not been much news on this issue so i guess uh, this this matter is going to take a little time but uh, look at the interesting position which we are in today uh, uh, it, it's fairly keenly uh, uh, poised we have uh, the, the the matter pending before the supreme court on whether this payment constitutes uh, royalty assume for a moment the supreme court was to hold that this constitutes royalty all right then uh, the likely impact of that would be, wouldn't it come out of equalization levy and come into section 9? Okay. As you for a moment, Supreme Court holds otherwise. It says, no, this is not royalty. All right. That's when this, this, this category, this, this uh, transaction could squarely come and sit within the ambit of equalization levy. 
it's a very interesting uh, uh, situation uh, we are in today having said that uh, uh, if you look at singapore if you look at other uh, 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 certain other jurisdictions they are fairly clear that uh, uh, downloads of software do not constitute royalty and uh, it is in, and uh, even uh, the oecd has uh, voiced a uh, uh, similar uh, view in its commentary and there uh, they are fairly clear that uh, 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 download of software sale of software uh, through online facilities they typically are are uh, matters uh, uh, under the purview of uh, digital taxation and they should get the treatment of digital taxation and not royalty so that backdrop uh, if not for the certification on uh, uh, on software downloads uh, before the supreme court it's a fairly straightforward matter saying that it will go into um, uh, 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 the equalization levy provisions um, having said this again uh, uh, there is this uh, definition of e-commerce All right, e-commerce includes digital products. So, Office Micro, Microsoft Office 365 is a classic case. That is a digital product. When Office 365 is downloaded from the net and installed on our systems, there's a digital transaction relation comes within the ambit of equalization levy. But again, we just have to wait and watch what the Supreme Court says. Uh, thereafter, thereafter the point becomes okay. Assume for a moment that the Supreme Court says that this transaction constitutes royalty. the debate would there after be would the lower rate of 2% apply or would the higher rate of 10% or 40% in non treaty cases apply subject to of course claiming credit in the foreign country which again has resulted in a host of uh, 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 ambiguities and uh, concerns uh, so as we speak today uh, this is a fairly open book while uh, all uh, 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 arguments on merits would point to point out to this aspect these transactions being within the ambit of equalization levy given the ongoing litigation we just have to wait and uh, 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 well thought out call having said that uh, 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 even the uh, recent uh, 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 note by the uh, un uh, committee on article 50 where they proposed uh, 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 they propose a similar kind of provision within the ambit of the treaty. They clearly bring this to these transactions within uh, 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 digital products and not royalty or software. Right. So the answer to that question is we just have to wait and watch to what the Supreme Court says. Having said that, on merits, ideally it should be within the purview of equalization. So back to you. Anyone? Anyone wants to add something? Uh, Narendra or Sachin? yeah in fact uh, just uh, uh, just to add what bharat mentioned in fact uh, we had uh, uh, we have uh, the debate uh, of uh, shrink wrapped software or a customized software um, is being uh, debated and of course as uh, bharat rightly mentioned that uh, that we have uh, some uh, you know this question being uh, Uh, is there before the honorable supreme court for the final decisions on this but having said that uh, the interesting point is uh, you know this uh, shrink wrapped software the, uh, you know it is held uh, supreme court has held that it is a goods now uh, now when you uh, when you have uh, this shrink wrapped software which is uh, which is downloadable online and it is said to be a goods and it is downloadable online so the question is uh, you know can still be considered as so therefore this download be considered as uh, applying uh, this equalization levy applies to this but the interesting another aspect which i thought uh, uh, you know uh, um, bharat i think uh, narendra mentioned is that uh, it is it is not it is while it is a sale Uh, it's by while it is uh, uh, the usage of uh, the Stringcraft so software, even though it is downloaded, it is only a license to use. It is not a sale. So therefore, uh, considering that it is uh, indeed a licensing of a software and it is not a sale of software, so from that perspective, even I feel that uh, the the equalization levy should not be applicable to download of software, even though it is a Stringcraft one. however it comes to the next levy is customized software what happens to a customized software customized software if you look at it fits into the definition of the services right so uh, is it online services while the question is it is uh, services customized to software while it is is it online services uh, to my mind it may not be it while it is a service but it may not be online service because 
um, because the services are rendered by uh, the software developer back in their offices they on their laptops uh, right uh, so therefore uh, and having developed in their laptops and it may be transmitted through uh, these uh, email facilities or something like that. So therefore, even from that perspective, I think uh, customized software also to my mind should not uh, levy, I mean, equalization levy should not be applicable even to that. I thought I'll just supplement what Bharat's view was. Uh, well, moving on to the next question, like uh, in EL1, uh, we were talking about uh, online advertising. Uh, Bharat, can you just, uh, give uh, your brief thought on uh, the full sale of advertisement uh, how will the advertisement be sold and uh, how it will be dealt in uh, equalization levy to briefly can you explain what it is sure uh, so this is a fairly uh, interesting uh, phrase which has been uh, uh, employed in uh, 165a uh, when there is a sale of advertisement between two non-residents and that advertisement targets a customer who is resident in India or who accesses the advertisement through an internet protocol address in India. That is what is sought to be the consideration which is received by one non-resident from the other non-resident is sought to be taxed if it relates to sale of advertising. So this phrase sale of advertisement is interesting. Let's go back in time. If we see 194C. 194C uh, today, for example, all advertising contracts, payments made to advertisers, say for example, a company uh, uh, engages an ad agency or uh, pays for a billboard uh, guy. Uh, TDS is made under 194C on the, on the basis that the payment is towards a contract of work and under 194C, work is defined to include advertising. Contract for advertising, payments for contract of advertising is what is sought to be subject to TDS under 194C. Thereafter, we've had uh, 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 equalization levy 1.0, which said specific, uh, payments for specific services would be subject to EL 1.0 at 6%. Specified services were defined to mean online advertising. Now, uh, coming to 165A, 165A uses the word sale Again, if we see throughout from 194C to 16, uh, 164, 165, they've never talked about any sale. They've said advertising. Advertising, income from advertising or income towards advertising activities are what are exigible to tax or TDS as the case may be. Let's see how an ad, uh, advertising uh, 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 arrangement works. So, for example, a company puts, uh, engages an ad, advertising agency and the advertising agency designs the ad. That ad is uh, uh, run either on the uh, uh, it's run on the internet. The ad is displayed on websites, it is displayed on apps, it is displayed on our games, or uh, in the real world, the app is displayed on the billboard. The app is displayed in the newspaper, uh, as the case may be. Is there a sale when when ad when an advertising activity is done? Is there a sale in the first place? Sale of ad. Who sells the ad to who is the question. Now let's see the context of this provision. The context of this provision is particularly cases where ads are targeted to Indian users, all right, and who are the uh, uh, Indian users of, of apps, of websites, etc., and who've been driving the uh, uh, usage on uh, uh, apps and uh, uh, such uh, uh, places. It's primarily Google or Facebook. I will take those names for simplicity alone. Um, so if Facebook runs an ad campaign, say for Nike in the US, say Nike around the world, it is seen by me and you on our phones, on our laptops, as the case may be. So the ad campaign is dri driven by, say, an advertising agency or an advertising exchange, whoever. Is there a sale of advertisement in such a case? Who sells the ad to whom? Facebook or Google is only facilitating the display of the ad. The advertising agency has driven the ad campaign. The design team within the advertising agency or within the ad service provider has designed the ad. If it is to be sold, if the ad is to be sold, right, uh, who is it being sold to? It's only a service or a activity of advertising which is given by which contract is given by the advertiser to an ad agency as the case. There is no sale of advertisement per se in this entire arrangement. It's only, uh, if you take Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., it's only an ad which gets displayed, all right? And 
Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, etc. They they earn their revenues from these displays and uh, from the impressions, clicks, downloads, as the case may be, whatever the metric has been uh, 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 agreed to with the advertiser. There is no particularly sale. Now this is where it becomes curious as to why was this phrase sale of advertisement used. Having said that, if we go with the spirit of the law, spirit of these provisions, it is explicitly to tax such arrangements. The way Google and Facebook uh, earn their revenues on the, uh, on the on the back of Indian users, that is the target. So uh, keeping that in mind, we can say that there is a sale, but isn't the intention evident from the language of the law? Again, this is where we go to the literal reading of the law. And when we go for this literal reading, there's a kind of an absurdity, a potential absurdity. It, it's not clear why this phrase sale of advertisement is used, exp, ex, uh, especially when year 2.0 came in out of the blue. It was not part of uh, uh, bu uh, budget 2020. It was simply part of the Finance Act 2020. So we do not have the uh, mind of the uh, legislature when it enacted this law. All of these uh, uh, aspects only uh, add to that uncertainty whether sale of advertisement really means what it is meant to be or uh, are, are we leaving too much into the law. Uh, this is this is one dimension in uh, 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 sale of advertisement. Again, sale of advertisement uh, uh, is referred to uh, in uh, section 9, context of... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, significant, uh, uh, sorry, in the context of uh, 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 there again they say uh, income attributable to the operations carried out in India shall include income from such advertisements which targets a customer. Sorry, income from advertisements targeting a customer which is sought to be taxed in section 9. But we have this use of, we have this phrase sale of advertisement in, in 165A. There has been consistent and well thought out use of advertising in 194C, in section 9, in section uh, uh, 165A. But we, we, uh, the, 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 the phrase sale of advertisement is something which is not very clear. Having said that, this is the literal reading. If we go back to the spirit, yes, this is what is sought to be taxed. So uh, uh, um, when, uh, uh, say, Google or Facebook receives uh, uh, income or, or uh, ad revenues from, say, Nike or Reebok, on displaying uh, their ads in a global campaign and the global campaign includes Indian users. This is the clause which will get triggered to tax Google or Facebook or LinkedIn as the case may be. So back to you. Uh, Bharat, uh, the next question I, I ask is uh, to, this question is to Sachin, whether collection and uh, sale of data, what is the applicability of uh, equation level? Like even once you see the definition of uh, e-commerce operations, it says even when uh, a non-resident collects a data and he uh, subsequently sells that data, that also attracts some levy. So your uh, views on this? Yeah. Yeah. Of data above, is it personal data alone or something else? You can just give uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, as far as, uh, let me take your second question first. Uh, as far as this uh, personal data, uh, there is no uh, di distinction as far as personal data, as business data is concerned, as far as the equalization levy is concerned. While that distinction uh, is there uh, in data protection law, uh, you know, in uh, data protection law, in, interestingly, there uh, uh, the government has been saying uh, the intermediary is uh, discouraging there. Uh, government is discouraging in data protection law for the intermediaries not to hold data right while having said that in equalization levy it goes on to say that you collect as much as data including data of uh, you know ip addresses you collect uh, because that is what is uh, is going to trigger this equalization levy right so as far as as i said the personal data is concerned or business data is concerned there is no distinction as far as uh, equalization levy is concerned now having said that um, you know interestingly uh this the sale of uh, the data the question of data comes in uh, to the picture uh, you know even even in uh, acp for that matter if you look at explanation 2a to uh, section 9 uh, also deals with transaction in respect of uh, download of data but interestingly if you look at in both the places whether it's in equalization levy or uh, 
or uh, uh, in uh, ACP, both the places, what is data, they have not tried to, um, you know, they have not defined it. But that uh, brings us to an interesting question. As uh, it was mentioned, I think uh, uh, it was uh, being mentioned by Narendra, uh, the, the EL2, in, you know, government intends in this particular case, uh, government intends to tax even the transaction between two non-residents right if it is uh, intended to tax you know the equalization levy they want to apply even if it is a transaction between two non residents in respect of the sale of advertisement which just now uh, bharat was mentioning and sale of data collected from person who is a resident in india or from a person who uses uh, ip uh, in india so it is it is quite sale of data collected from a person who is resident in india that is fine understandable or from a person who uses IP address uh, located in India, it's also understandable. But the entire thing we have to understand is how is that the mechanism of identifying IP address government is going to implement is, is something which we have to really look at it. Uh, in, it's a quite interesting topic because, because if you look at a person non-resident uh, who is a visitor to India, a uh, US citizen comes on a visit to India, and he uses, uh, uh, you know, he uses a laptop of his friend, and uh, you know, he does a e-commerce transaction. So, because he is a non-resident and uses a Indian IP address, uh, is it getting covered? Uh, you know, the answer is yes, it is getting covered. So, okay. so similarly, uh, if you look at some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, Indian residents uh, who want to, uh, you know. Uh, access some of the data some of the movies let us say so those movies uh, if they're not able to access here in india for whatever reason they uh, you know it is available there in the us and it is not accept, uh, available in india so they have a mechanism uh, through which they can access it where that mechanism how it works is you use your ip address and go to a particular uh you know website and there the ip address changes and some other different ip address goes to uh, that uh, that particular uh, platform where you can download the movie or watch that movie right in this kind of a situation if you look at uh, you know while ip address uh, may not be belonging to in first case ip address belongs to india but then the per person is uh, not from india in second case person is in india but ip address may not be there of india so these are some of the interesting propositions that are there as far as this data a, a sale of data is concerned Okay. Uh, well, Sachin, just to ask you the uh, next question, like this B2C transactions are not uh, covered in uh, EL1. So yes. it specifically says it's only B2B transactions are covered. But when it comes to EL2, there is no specific mention. So what is your views on that, whether uh, in B2C transactions in EL2 is also applicable? Yes, in EL2, I think uh, B2B, B2C, I think to my mind, all these transactions should be applicable as far as EL2 is concerned. Okay. Okay, next question to Narendra. Can you tell me the interplay between uh, equalization levy and section 194O? Like uh, even 194O uh, was introduced in the Finance Act along with uh, the EL2 in the uh, this was uh, this was part of the income tax act, and that was as a finance act, uh, uh, section eight. Uh, it was chapter eight it was introduced. So both uh, deals with uh, similar operations, but the one ninety four O deals with uh, resident uh, e commerce operators, uh, equalization levy for uh, non resident operators. Is there any interplay between these two? Uh, yeah. So. If you look at these two provisions, uh, there is a very similar terminology, similar structure in which uh, they have been implemented. Personally, I feel they both are implemented or inserted with different objectives. It's a different issue that these two have some interplay, have some interesting ramifications that may arise. That's a different issue. Now, what does 194 capital O provide? Uh, so if there is an e-commerce operator, the definition is similar to what we have in 164. And there is an e-commerce participant. Now, the concept of e-commerce participant is not there in equalization levy. So if there is an e-commerce participant, the e-commerce participant uh, should be a resident in the context of 194O. If the e-commerce participant is resident and the e-commerce operator, now the for e-commerce 
fitter, they have not stated whether he can be a resident or a non-resident. Let's first take an example, simple example of say Amazon India, Amazon.in. He is an e-commerce operator, right? And suppose uh, there is a vendor who lists his goods on uh, Amazon, say Cloudtail, and he is an e-commerce participant. Now, Amazon facilitates the sale of goods of Cloudtail to people in India. Uh, Amazon receives the say the payment from the customers in India and then pass it on that payment to Cloudtail, who is an e-commerce participant. An e-commerce participant should be resident. The 194 capital O provides that these payments where the sale of goods is facilitated by the e-commerce operator, it could be goods or services, is facilitated by the operator the TDS would be deducted by the operator when the payment is made by the operator to the e-commerce participant. So when Amazon makes a payment to Cloudtail, Amazon India makes a payment to Cloudtail, on that payment 194 capital O would be attracted. Now when you come to interplay between this and EL, it would appear this is, uh, I mean both are moving into different direction, but important aspect here is instead of Amazon, say there was an Alibaba or there is any other e-commerce operator who is non-resident and on that non-resident e-commerce operators platform there is an e-commerce participant from india who has hosted his goods or services so if the question that would arise is when such a non-resident e-commerce operator when he makes a payment to resident e-commerce participant whether the tds provisions under 194 capital o would be attractive Keep it in mind that 194O only talks of facilitation. It doesn't talk of other two limbs of uh, e-commerce supply services like uh, owned by the e-commerce operator or online provision of services uh, by e-commerce operator. Those two limbs are not there in 194O. The only limb that is there in 194O is facilitation of sale of goods or services of e-commerce participant by e-commerce operator. The question that is, is there, now suppose there is an Alibaba and for, for some reasons, let's assume it's possible that goods of an e-commerce participant in India are hosted on the website of Alibaba and someone has placed the order and goods are delivered to customer in India or somewhere else. Now, is Alibaba, which is a non-resident e-commerce operator who's making a payment to e-commerce participant in India liable to deduct TDS, resident in India liable to deduct TDS under 194 capital O. That is the issue that would arise. E Alibaba by itself may be chargeable under equalization levy because it is an e-commerce operator and it is making a sale to say a resident in India, that's a different issue. So EL would, itself would be applicable to Alibaba if the, if the sale is to the resident person resident in India. But when it comes to 194O, the question would be whether you can make a non-resident to comply with the TDS provision outside India. If you look at surplus 726 of 1995, it was in the context of 194J. Now, if a non-resident makes a payment of professional services to a resident, is the question whether the 194J provisions are applicable. Now, if you look at all the TDS provisions, they talk of a recipient. They don't talk of a... If the payer, if the recipient of income is person resident in India, so if you make uh, a payment to a resident in India, then they say TDS provisions say 194J is applicable. Now, in those cases, the circular 726 said that uh, the fees which are paid through banking channels to say any chartered accountant, lawyer, advocate, etc., who is resident in India, the non-resident do not have an, and the non-resident do not have any agent or business connection or permanent establishment in India, they would not be liable to deduct TDS as per the provisions of section, section 194J of the Income Tax Act. But the challenge is arisen because of the amendment to section 204. The 204 says that the non-resident also will be a person liable to deduct TDS. Non-resident also will be a person liable to deduct TDS. Because of that, this conflict arises. The circular 726 has not been withdrawn. That states as it is. Though it is in the specific context of 194J, the rationale of that possibly one could try and apply to 194O and apply the principles of extraterritoriality in the concept of compliances by non-resident. Because here you are making a payment to a resident, resident would anyway file return of income in India. It is more easier to ask him to comply with the Indian laws. Therefore, though this amendment to 204 is creating a problem, there is a 
possibility to apply the rationale of circular 726 and argue that a non-resident cannot be made liable to tedious compliances for resident payments. If 204's amendment is stretched in such a way, that would have that will create problem for all TDS provisions because every professional fee is made, say, paid by a non-resident to Indian professionals, then there would be a problem or similar for commission or anything else, those problems would arise. So we'll have to take a harmonious view here and say that the compliances should trigger only for the residents and not for the non-residents. Uh, well, Narendra, we the next question you already answered. Yes. With respect to section 1050, which has been postponed to 1-4-2021. So in yes. uh, this year, this uh, financial year 2021, uh, the both equalization levy and uh, income tax act. Like uh, the section 1050 is not uh, exempted. So you already uh, in some uh, some uh, in some other context you just uh, explained this. So what I what my specific question is in this uh, intervening period, does this mean uh, that yield two as well as potential royalty or FTS uh, could be triggered? That is both 10 percent and 2 percent will be levyable for current financial year. This one year is a challenge because this issue has been raised in various forums. This has been brought to the notice of uh, even the tax authorities that ideally you should have given the 1050 exemption for this financial year itself. They have given this exemption from next financial year. So if you go by literal reading again uh, on a single transaction, there is a for this financial year, there's a risk that it could be royalty FTS as well as equalization levy 10% this side and 2% that side both may be applicable. So that risk remains uh, unless they clarify this issue very specifically. They break out uh, to say that this one year also we will give the benefit of 10 uh, They have not clarified this. In fact, the revenue secretary had mentioned that we will not clarify anything on EL. The provisions are clear cut. That is the has been the approach as of now of the uh, tax authorities, which is unfortunate. I feel uh, there is a double taxation. Now, can this double taxation be challenged is all matters uh, for judicial review, judicial uh, interference. At this stage, if you ask a question whether both are applicable on a literal reading, both are applicable. They lead to double taxation, one could challenge them on that grounds. But then there are quite a few decisions which also say that if the statute provides double taxation can be done. Though there are decisions on the other side also, but there are quite a few decisions that say that if double taxation is permitted by statute, there is nothing harm in having the double taxation. So like two, what you mean to say is, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah continue, continue. Yeah. Like, uh, like uh, there was one example earlier when uh, uh, Royal means the software was considered a good. So both uh, uh, VAT and service tax was levied. Similar to that, there are so, so, so certain situations where both uh, taxes may be levied. So it's uh, instead of saying double taxation, we can also say two types of taxation. One is income tax, one is equal levy. So for this intervening period. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, members, so now we have uh, discussed uh, about uh, some of the uh, nuances or provisions of uh, equalization levy. Now, uh, after understanding these things, now it's time for us to uh, move on to some of, some of the procedural aspects. So my question to Bharat is, can you kindly explain the procedural aspects of uh, equalization levy? Like, uh, what all the, like, uh, EL1 is deduction, EL2 is payment. Then what are the interest penalty and what are the due dates? Just briefly, can you explain the procedural aspects? Sure. sure. Uh, so on the procedural front, uh, the first point becomes uh, uh, when do we uh, 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 collect and pay the taxes? Uh, so on EL 1.0, the 6% uh, 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 levy should be collected and deposited uh, uh, at the 7th of uh, 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 every month. Uh, coming to uh, EL 2.0, the rate is uh, 1%, but again, this uh, uh, liability has to be discharged uh, on a uh, quarterly basis. Uh, so the uh, due dates are uh, again uh, on a quarterly basis. So uh, for the quarterly 30th June, it would be 7th July. For the quarterly 30th September, it's 7th October. 31st December, it's 7th January. Uh, and lastly, uh, what is unfortunate is for the last quarter, uh, uh, ending 31st March, yes. the due date itself is 31st March itself. Uh, this is a, a, a little bit uh, uh, harsh because uh, uh, just contrasting it with our TDS provisions for the last quarter of every year, we have an extended uh, uh, timeline for uh, depositing the taxes. 
uh, but I hope uh, there is some clarification uh, on this uh, because of the innate difficulty involved in uh, estimating and uh, determining and uh, depositing uh, the uh, 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 amount uh, of uh, uh, equalization levy. Uh, so now with the due dates uh, pretty clear, uh, the next uh, uh, part of the process is uh, uh, on the challenge. So the equalization EL 1.0 challenge are fairly clear. The EL 2.0 challenge, there was a little bit of ambiguity because uh, 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 there was no provision in the uh, 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 challenge to make uh, uh, to make payments uh, uh, in relation to EL 2.0. But then uh, for EL 2.0, uh, the online uh, forms are uh, uh, duly amended and uh, 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 the challenge has been updated uh, basically to provide for uh, uh, the uh, EL 2.0. One important aspect on EL 2.0 uh, is the requirement of a PAN for the non-resident uh, e-commerce operator. So uh, all these e-commerce operators would now be required to uh, obtain a PAN in India. Uh, so uh, uh, this itself would be a process for, uh, for these uh, 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 non-resident e-commerce operators. And for, for many years now, there have been apprehensions whether just taking a pan would result in a taxable presence. So with uh, uh, equalization levy, uh, the challan asking for a pan uh, uh, in the challan itself, now uh, there seems to be no choice for uh, e-commerce operators. Having said that, the point is whether a form can drive a requirement. Uh, this again has its own uh, difficulties and uh, interpretation challenges, uh, but we'll leave, it, uh, leave that to another day given the time frame. So a PAN is something which a uh, non-resident e-commerce operator should have to uh, obtain. So now once the e-commerce, uh, once the uh, uh, amounts are paid, the point uh, uh, then comes down to uh, the forms to be filed. So in respect of uh, year 1.0, the forms have been notified. The forms were already being filed by uh, uh, companies. Uh, the point was who was processing that. So for example, if we take our income tax returns and our TDS returns, we know for sure that the CPC and the uh, traces uh, 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 wing of the department are processing these returns. But uh, with uh, EL 1.0 and 2.0, there is today no uh, absolute clarity on how the processing of the returns are happening. Uh, from whatever I could uh, make out uh, uh, from the information on the net, uh, um, uh, the DG systems has not notified. It appears that the, the, the process for uh, the, the, the process for uh, uh, acting on these statements has not been notified. Having said that, this can always go back in time and the DG systems could notify it uh, uh, from day one. Uh, uh, that is on the forms. While the, again, while the forms for year 1.0 are clear for year 2.0, the forms are not yet amended. So even today, the EL uh, form, which is the annual form, uh, still reads form uh, for specified services. So specified services in the, is in the context of 165 EL 1.0. But for 2.0, uh, the, uh, the form still reads statement of specified services. So since there is quite some time uh, left for the department to come up with uh, uh, the amendments, I guess uh, those amendments have not been made, but it is fair to expect that these forms also would be amended so that uh, within the timeline uh, for filing the annual return, uh, annual uh, uh, return, uh, the amendment will be made. So once the forms are made, the point becomes how a processing is done and how those forms are acted upon uh, uh, in the income tax context or in any in the context of any revenue law. We have these concepts of assessments. So our returns are assessed by the tax office. Unfortunately, the the uh, as of now. Uh, the provisions, interestingly, rather not unfortunately, interestingly, the provisions do not uh, uh, contemplate an assessment. The provisions only contemplate a rectification. There are no provisions for assessment. However, there are provisions which uh, uh, levy a penalty for non-compliance with the EL 2.0 uh, provisions. This, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, again, all of this boils down to constitutionality, whether a uh, penalty can be levied without an assessment and uh, uh, whether a pair, uh, whether the AO can uh, um, uh, uh, levy the penalty without determining whether uh, in the first place the non-resident e-commerce operator was rightly subject to EL 2.0. There are no assessment uh, 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 mechanisms prescribed today. Uh, 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 I believe that there, there, there would be uh, 
uh, clarifications coming out on this. Uh, again, assuming for a moment uh, a penalty is identified for whatever reason, uh, it's only the penalty which can be challenged before the commissioner appeals. Again, any, any assessment, etc., is something which is not uh, which uh, uh, is not contemplated uh, uh, for an appeal uh, mechanism, which itself um, uh, uh, appears very interesting. And uh, uh, I may dare say so that it, it is very strange that without an assessment and appeal mechanism. The EL provisions uh, have been uh, introduced and carried forward. Uh, the penalty, again, as I said, uh, the penalty provisions, uh, the penalty is something which the officers can levy. That is appealable before the Commissioner Appeals, which is also appealable before the uh, Income Tax Appellate Tribunal uh, and thereafter before the High Court Supreme Court. Uh, those are on the uh, procedural parts. And again, on, on the assessment, the provisions say that officers, uh, the, the the provisions of section 119 and 120 would apply to uh, to, to uh, equalization levy. Uh, so what is interesting is how are they going to identify officers who would do the assessment of equalization levy? That is pretty unclear as of now. No notifications have come out uh, assigning ranges to uh, do the assessment of equalization levy. All of that is in the open. Uh, uh, I believe. Uh, uh, clarifications on this will come out uh, sooner or later, uh, but uh, but but uh, like uh, uh, Narendra mentioned, it is uh, a bit unfortunate because the statement uh, still mentioned that uh, on EL 2.0, no more clarifications are required, and the law is pretty clear. Uh, 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 it is un unclear as to how how they they are very sure that without appeal, appeal mechanisms, of uh, uh, can be levied uh, and uh, thereafter. So this is very this is a very interesting part of uh, the equalization levy provisions. The norms have been notified, but uh, not fully amended to reflect uh, the law. Um, uh, uh, payments uh, interest interest also has been prescribed for delayed payment uh, of, uh, of uh, the equalization levy. Um, uh, apart from this, uh, one other aspect which uh, taxpayers ought to look forward to is. Uh, um, uh, certainty on equalization levy. So, for example, in the context of uh, the Income Tax Act, we have the authority for advance rulings uh, to determine whether an income is taxable, whether a rate of tax particularly applies, or we can go to the assessing officer to ask for a lower rate of tax. This kind of flexibility and approachability is something which is not uh, factored in the law, uh, especially uh, if we recollect uh, uh, the AR provisions were initially uh, put in place particularly for non-residents, so that uh, 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 in the context of ease of doing business, non-residents could have tax certainty in India. Uh, it would be welcome if such similar provisions were to were to be put in place even uh, for uh, uh, equalization levy. But uh, those are things which we only have to wait and watch. So uh, procedural provisions are fairly uh, in in a very nascent stage. The forms payment mechanisms have been instituted, but thereafter uh, things are fairly uh, uh, open and uh, uh, subject to a little bit of uh, confusion and uh, uh, uncertainty. So back to you. Well, Bharat, uh, thank you for uh, covering in detail the procedural aspects. Only one. Uh... Uh, elementary doubt which uh, most of us will get like for uh, year one for uh, year one when we are deducting resident is deducting uh, the equation levy in the form of tds the non-resident need not uh, obtain a pan because as per section 2 206 double eight won't discuss anything about uh, a non-resident obtaining a pan but when it comes to year two where non-resident has to pay the taxes that at that particular point of time, definitely he has to obtain a PAN and uh, file the return of income. Yes. Okay. Correct, na? Okay. Yes, that's right. Now, uh, now we'll move on to other aspects. Of course, uh, we know that there are the limits that is for year one, it is one lakh, and for year two, it is two crores applicable to non residents. Beyond that, uh, this EL will be levied. Now, lastly, we have a few more questions uh, mm -hmm. with respect to this. Uh, uh, Technical technicalities like whether equalization levy overrides DTA. Uh, Bharat, if you can uh, quickly deal with this within uh, maybe two or three minutes, whether equalization levy overrides DTA. Because why this question has come is uh, equalization levy is not part of the Income Tax Act and it is uh, introduced in the form of uh, a separate schedule in the Finance Act. And when we, when we talk about TTA, 
it talks about either income tax law or DTA, whichever is beneficial. Now, in this situation, whether equation levy overrides DTA. Sure. If you can just uh, spare uh, two, three minutes and uh, quickly uh, give your views on this. Sure, sure. Uh, so, the immediate response to that question whether uh, equalization levy uh, would override the DTA, uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, I would say that uh, the provisions of the uh, DTA should not apply uh, uh, to test whether. Uh, 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 incomes, uh, other considerations uh, subject to equalization levy are under the ambit of the DTA. That is simply because the uh, provisions of the uh, double taxation avoidance agreements today do not con uh, do not uh, include equalization levy as a tax which can be claimed as a credit or uh, 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 the entire mechanism of uh, equalization levy is something which is not visualized in the uh, DTA as a tax. Uh, that is the basis for my initial reaction that uh, uh, EL would override the DTA. Uh, but uh, I'll just uh, take one minute to leave aside a thought uh, uh, which uh, came up uh, uh, just when we were uh, doing this reading. So, uh, under the DTAs, relief is provided in respect of specified taxes. And uh, DTAs allocate taxing rights to two countries towards particular incomes. Thereafter, DTAs also provide a mechanism for claiming credit uh, uh, for a resident taxpayer in respect of tax paid in the source jurisdiction. So, if we take these three parts of the DTA and see whether an, an equalization levy can be squeezed into, uh, this is a thought experiment. I'll just leave this thought. I do not have any conclusive answers, uh, uh, unfortunately, but uh, this is something worth deliberating. I'll take about a minute's time to uh, share this. Um, so, the um, uh, uh, provisions of a DTA typically, they say what are the taxes which are covered under the DTA. So, they say income tax and capital gains tax, etc. They list a set of taxes. There is typically a second paragraph in, in that article which says uh, uh, the, these agreements shall also apply to identical or substantially similar taxes which are imposed by either contracting states after the date of signature of uh, the present agreement in addition to the taxes discussed previously. So now, again, this debate comes whether the equalization levy is a tax substantially similar to the income tax act. All right. So we've had this discussion. Narendra walked us through uh, uh, this point of whether uh, equalization levy constitutes a direct tax or an indirect tax or an income tax or an indirect tax. So Assume for a moment we are to hold that these uh, uh, an equalization levy is similar to an uh, income tax, then there is a vista open to explore the subsequent uh, provisions. That's where uh, after after uh, crossing this threshold, assume we cross this threshold, the next question comes is what is this income, so to say, which has been subject to double taxation? So, in the context of treaties, we have dividends, interest, royalties, FTS, and thereafter business profit. So, uh, these, uh, uh, so for uh, dividends, interest, and uh, royalties and FTS, there is a gross basis of taxation, whereas for business profits, only if there is a PE is a tax levy. Typically, these kind of uh, 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 incomes on sale of goods, etc., would constitute business income. So, thereafter, in the absence of a PE, there should be no tax. Applying that logic here, this would simply be categorized as business income and therefore a tax has been wrongly levied, etc. That debate will go on. However, if we were to take the view that business income, the, 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 the article of business profits will not trigger, but it is the article on other income which triggers, right? And we were to say that in light of the other income provisions, India has exercised its right to tax and charged this equalization levy. Can we thereafter go to the credit provisions and seek credit of this equalization levy as an income tax in the source country? Is a thought which we had. Uh, so I just leave that thought. Uh, in the interest of time, we will move on. But uh, what I would want to uh, mention to the audience and uh, to the larger groups is that uh, this is something which ought to be explored, debated, deliberated, uh, uh, stone thrown, tomatoes thrown on this view. But it's worthwhile ex exploring whether this is a substantially similar tax and whether the income comes under the ambit of other income. I know there are rulings which say that other income, when there are, when there are business profits, you cannot go to the other income class. All right? 
but this is something which we ought to explore given the wide ramifications which the EL provisions have today. So back to you. Okay, Bharat, thank you. Uh, Chairman, I think we are uh, at 654 and we have a few, few questions uh, that has been posed by the participants. If we if you spare around 10 to 15 minutes, we can uh, just uh, complete those questions as per your uh, this thing. If our members are interested, we can take yeah. up a few questions and uh, go ahead. Yeah, you can, you can take, sir, for 10 minutes, you can take yeah. some time. Yeah, can I can okay. I get the question, questions and answers? Uh, Quest questions uh, in the question box, uh, they have asked the questions uh, on Srinivas and uh, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the e -commerce I think some, of the some of the questions I have here so that I will uh, go through some of these questions. Meanwhile, others also can look into the questions here. I think Sunil Bhatt has asked also wanted to know if MNC have internal ERP system from where group company in India can place order and sell subsequently in India. Is the EL applicable when Indian company makes payment to a parent company? So in here the question is uh, because he has a ERP. ERP while he has a ERP and for which he is rendering some uh, uh, services uh, to its group companies. Uh, so it is basically intra-group services possibly he is what mentioning. But the thing is while intra-group company services as we discussed earlier. So the parent company in this particular case uh, the group company MNC group company. Uh, may not be owning uh, this this particular uh, he may not be an e-commerce operator who is uh, who owns operates or manages this digital platform this erp system may not be he might not be owning that the, the company mnc may not be owning that right so therefore uh, in such situation it should not uh, erp equalization levy should not be applicable next to srinivasan i, I think he has asked uh, as equalization levy is not on the income earned by e-commerce operator but on the consideration received by the operator, therefore claiming a credit for the levy against the income in the country of residence may prove a problem with the most bilateral treaties. Yeah, absolutely. I think this matter was already discussed. Uh, equalization levy is not an income tax. It is there in the Finance Act. So therefore, uh, the question of you claiming a credit in uh, the other jurisdiction may not arise at all in this uh, particular case. So that is what Srinivasan has uh, mentioned. If uh, next is uh, Srikanta, if a uh, uh, placement order or phone or email accepting online uh, sale with wider definition, perhaps I think uh, this, uh, I mean, uh, I did not really answer if placement of um, if placement order or phone or email accepting the online sales with wider definition, perhaps the email operator, telephone operator become an e-commerce operator because he facilitates. Uh, as I said here, we were we were discussing about providing our services uh, over email, uh, and uh, you know so therefore we since the the provider of services does not own a, uh, the facility, so therefore we to uh, our view uh, in fact all uniformly we have discussed this and we have said that you know it should not attract uh, equalization levy on this matter. So, I mean, others, uh, if you can take up other questions so that I'll find uh, out. Like, uh, there, is, there is one question. Uh, I think uh, on this article 50. Entry 55. Man, Manjana, yeah. uh, my entry 55. Narendra, if you can take this, Manjana Bichi. On constitutionality yeah. of EL, you mentioned that entry 55. You can just uh, explain it. Yeah, yeah. The question is uh, uh, entry 55 only empowers state. So, union is excluded taking advertisement. How then ST, I believe ST service tax was levied by union on advertisement services. Now, if you look at entry 55 as it stands before 2016, it says tax on advertisement other than advertisement published in newspaper, advertisement broadcast by radio or television. So advertisements published in newspaper, advertisements uh, by radio and television, those power was not with the state. So those power was with the union only. Only apart from these what advertisement could have come, that power stayed with the uh, state under the old entry 55. So if you are displaying on the uh, online medium, uh, the exclusion portion will not be applicable. So there is where the challenge could be there. 
the st on advertisement no one has challenged till date and no one has challenged the legislative competence of either service tax on advertisement till date and also on the aspect of uh, el1 no one has challenged so there is no judicial precedent on this part no one has debated this issue but this is a very interesting proposition which is there that el1 uh, should have fall in entry 55 of uh, state list and the center should not have power to uh, levy tax on that yeah okay interesting another uh, interesting uh, question well, but that's another interesting question related question pranav has asked uh, considering in case where management fee is charged uh, pranav asks in a case where management fee is charged by microsoft us uh, to microsoft india through its own facilities say microsoft office 365 can we say that el2 is applicable it's quite a interesting uh, question uh, because here according to him it uh, microsoft becomes a e-commerce operator right but uh, but uh, if you look at uh, the original the report uh, initial reports of uh, e-commerce uh, i mean equalization levy there was a concept uh, called uh, i mean not a concept but the origin of this equalization levy is on one to many see one person rendering services to many people you know that is when the equalization levy should trigger that is what is original understanding of equalization levy i mean is it this uh, this uh, understanding is it captured in the uh, finance act of equalization no that that aspect is not captured while it is not captured but definitely it has a persuasive value that uh, the transaction has to be one to many and it is not one to one in this particular case microsoft us to microsoft india it is to my mind it is one to one so therefore from that perspective we have a good case to say that equalization levy should not be applicable in this case uh chairman can we take few more questions or uh, should we wind up okay. yeah if there are questions is there you can take sir yeah, yeah. Me, because like, uh, i am i have missed track some of the questions you answered and typed so yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly where it is <laughs> okay yeah, now okay. no, no, let me take, uh, take the questions in order i request all the panelists i will just read the question uh, and i uh, allocate to you so that you can answer so that we can cover as many questions as possible the yeah, first yeah. question is the e-commerce operators are annoyed at the ambush by equation levy since the changes were not part of budget 2020 they have roped in the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, which is going to begin Section 301 investigations against India Unilateral. The Unilateral ta tariffs or other trade restrictions on Indian companies are like likely from the U.S. government. If the allegations are proved right, is in this context, how can India defend itself? Uh, maybe Narendra can answer this. So yeah, this is a, I mean, it is a kind of a trade war. Uh, which is there, yeah. and it is not just restricted to India. Many countries, the U.S. has targeted. France is France is one, UK is one. So where they are trying to levy tariffs so that they can roll back this uh, 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 digital taxation or levies of similar nature, like equalization levy. Uh, these country, I mean, again, the final the, possibly there is also delay in finalization the global approach of taxation of this because of U.S. intervention. Because most of these multinational are. U.S. companies, and this is a normal tactic of U.S. to ambush and buy uh, tariffs and other things. Uh, I mean, Indian India would defend be able to defend this because there is a good amount of nexus, especially, and uh, the two sides of a transaction, buyer and seller. The seller buyers are in India, sellers may be outside India. There's a good amount of value created through data. So all these aspects should bring in the new nexus concept, which even the OECD is articulating. And somewhere uh, there will be a middle line drawn between what we have today and no taxation and from the extreme taxation or somewhere this uh, middle line would be drawn and some, it will all be come to a negotiation table to bring out uh, some middle way to uh, have conclude on these matters. Yeah, like uh, in fact, uh, just continue to that, like even US, uh, I heard that there's past two acts that is guilty and paid to plug this tax avoidance by US taxpayers. So this yeah. uh, trade war continues, let us uh, wait for that and let us be part of that. Uh, the next question is from uh, Sabarishan CK, where he says, uh, what if the goods sold on e-commerce platform are not owned by the e-commerce operators, but who only provides a marketplace? Of course, uh, Bharat said uh, the definition of e-commerce operator where he owns, operates, or facilitates. So, in that regard, uh, your quick uh, response to this uh, question, Bharat. Sure, sir. So, uh, I think uh, this was something which even uh, Narendra emphasized. 
uh, when he was discussing uh, consideration. So even uh, where in a marketplace model, given that uh, there's a facilitation of the uh, uh, goods and services activity, uh, the EL uh, 2.0 provisions would be triggered. Uh, and here the more important question uh, would be how the consideration on which EL uh, 2.0 is to be levied. That uh, the, the issue of consideration becomes uh, very critical on what do we charge the equalization levy? Is it on the gross value or the net value? And there, uh, like uh, Naril had mentioned the, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, brief uh, discussion, uh, it should be on the net. Uh, and this is where uh, 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 e-commerce operators who run the marketplace models, they need to put in place systems wherein they will be able to identify this, this consideration clearly. And this is where a lot of debate, etc., discussion should be triggered within uh, uh, such uh, uh, players. Uh, uh, so that, uh, uh, especially given the fact that the, the volumes are going to be significant uh, if it's from India, and uh, uh, it's uh, the game on consideration. How is the point on consideration determined? Any Okay. Now the next question is: uh, Should India wait for the OECD to finalize its rules regarding equalization levy? Of course, uh, uh, in the previous uh, question, uh, Narendra also answered, and I also gave some thoughts. Like after the trade war, uh, this is not just India which has uh, levied this equalization levy. Similar taxes have been levied by many countries. And once USA started this trade war, if you see EL one and EL two, many countries from eight percent or ten percent or six percent, now they have come to. 2% or 3%. So in that regard, since uh, there is no consensus among all the nations, I think India should go ahead and uh, frame its rules as of now and uh, wait for the things that has to happen in future. India has already Which implemented. Was, India yeah, has already implemented. implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Implement. Yeah. Yeah. The trigger has already so, been Sunil, Sunil but uh, that has already been answered. Uh, yeah. Next is Srinivasan, Srinivasan, yes, 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 as equalization levy is not on the income earned by the e-commerce of the address, 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 okay, okay. Bilateral tax rate is covering only tax yes, on income. Address, so, address. so I think Bharat has uh, given that. Uh, Shrikanta here, I think, has already been answered. Sneha Badrinath, if an Indian necessity obtains a service of an e-commerce operator for advertising or marketing services, customers of which are located outside India, that is, target audience of such marketing services are outside India, whether EL is available under EL1 or EL2? Only NR to NR only where the customers are in India. Target of advertisement is in India. Here the question is the yeah. advertisement is outside India, so it should not be applicable. Yeah, applicable. Customers okay. are outside India. Next one is from Manish Joshi. Whether sale of software provided by parent company to the customers in India for which pre and post sales marketing is facilitated by a subsidiary in India would fall within the equalization level. Uh, Sachin, if you can quickly answer this. Uh, when the sale of software provided by parent company to customers in India, for which uh, pre and post sales marketing services is facilitated by subsidiary company, would fall within uh, the. See, here the subsidiary company is providing services to Indian uh, uh, residents. So the services are between Indian resident uh, company and a uh, resident individual. So therefore, there should not be this equalization levy, should not be applicable for such cases. Okay. Next one is Srikanta in sale of advertisements. If two non residents to be taxed, the advertisement is targeted in India, then global brands advertisement without any specific geographical area will not be covered. If covered, how the transaction value subject to here to be determined? Uh, when uh, we talk about uh, extraterritorial uh, uh, nexus or uh, how to approach extraterritorial this thing, uh, Narendra had explained this brief, uh, explained in detail. Maybe Narendra, if you can just briefly explain this. No, here again, the similar question that if the advertisement is, if two non residents are there and only it will be taxed if the advertisement is targeted to customers in India, only in that context mm -hmm. it will be taxed in India. So, if it is a general advertisement without any specific geographical area, it will not be covered. So, the whole point is who is the target audience for that advertisement? If it is in India, yes, there is a, the statute provides for taxation. Constitutionality is a different issue, but statute provides for taxation of it. Yeah, just to add, uh, just to add to this, uh, one interesting proposition is uh, global brands when they uh, give one check for an advertisement, uh, uh, advertisement which is across the uh, world. So then, possibly that allocation may turn out to be one of the key for uh, levying this uh, equalization levy. 
See, for example, HLL gives an advertisement, uh, one check to advertising agency, and it is for uh, the global advertisement. So possibly then we one has to allocate based on the keys, some of the keys then allocate that towards India and uh, equalization levy may have to be applied to that. Okay. Uh, so okay, next question uh, uh, to this point, uh, because there is a finer business dimension to this, which I just want to share. Uh, uh, just to quickly, 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 uh, but it's quickly you have to wind up. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, assume there is an ad which is uh, driven uh, through Facebook by say Ferrari. And uh, typically the way these uh, this works is the, the ask from Ferrari would be, please target uh, high net worth individuals or uh, uh, people with uh, uh, richer tastes. And uh, again, this is ge geography agnostic, but then there would uh, the, the users are fairly high net worth individuals who would be targeted in that sense, not from the standpoint of a geographical area, but on account of their tastes and expenditure uh, patterns or viewership patterns. Uh, and uh, uh, typically Facebook and all such operators, they track which geography as per uh, in their systems, they have to track which geography the uh, ad has been displayed and the ad has been seen. Uh, that's the whole point of uh, programmatic advertising, uh, which is a big uh, deal uh, today and which is actually the subject matter of year. Uh, so in that backdrop, uh, it's the role of Facebook, etc., to actually see whether there is a, there has been an India burn in uh, the in uh, advertising marketing language. The the ad has been seen in India, but the point which still remains is whether that ad has targeted a user in India. It's not targeted a user in India, but the target has been a user with corresponding tests. So this is a fairly tricky issue and this is likely to come up uh, for uh, uh, discussion uh, sooner or later. Okay. Yes, sir. Next question is from Vijay Rai. He has TDS in section 195 of the IT Act and TDS in section 165 of uh, equation levy. Will it not amount to double TDS on advertisement? The answer is uh, this is this covers under EL1 where section 1050 is very clear. If uh, you are deducting tax under uh, if you are deducting tax under uh, equation levy, then there is no taxation on income tax act. Or if you are doing under income tax act, there is no equation levy. So there is no question of double taxation. Uh, is, is that correct or any other views? Yes. Correct, correct. Yeah, it's correct. It's correct. Oh, okay. Next, Vishwa Vishwa Shagarwal, can EL be paid by a representative of foreign entity? In, uh, this is uh, with respect to EL2, EL2 because uh, payment is only in EL2. Right. So, EL2, either, but hmm. I mean, uh, the provisions of Chapter 15 have been extended. So, if there is an agent who wants to discharge the liability of a uh, entity, that should be possible. Should be, yeah. I mean, no. uh, should be possible. Yeah. Okay. Is EL applicable to Indian entities set up their offices outside India? And if uh, my this is Mayesh Kumar number has asked this, applicability to Indian entities set up their offices outside India. So the requirement the question is, is so they should be resident in India. So as no, as if, uh, I think uh, he's saying, yeah. he is saying uh, an entity, an Indian entity set up outside India, whether it amounts to non-resident and EL is applicable. Yes, so uh, sir, if for example, if they are set up as branch companies, branch, branch mm -hmm. offices, mm -hmm. sir, branch office, branch offices, yeah. offices, they would be resident in India. Yeah. So there's uh, there are no yeah, question yeah, of. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. It's a very interesting point. I mean. Uh, point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This pranavas, I think, have already been answered, right? In case of. Uh, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Next again. Uh, sir, believe that question is answered by. That answered I by Sri Kumar. I think already covered. Yes. Time is up. <laughs> no, no. Yes, yes, sir, yes. answered. Yes. Pranavas uh, will yield to apply. Pranavas will yield to apply for sale of applications by Google Play Store. Whether mobile applications will be treated as sale of uh, service or goods? Apps would typically be considered as digital products, sir. So, likely to okay. be again, uh, if they charge, if they do charge for it, yes. Okay, next to Manish Kumar. Yeah. We will take somebody which has not been answered. Netravati PM, whether equation levy is applicable on payments made by private uh, limited company in India to German company for server space located in Germany. Where is the service is served from German company. Of course, uh, since we have answered that, uh, whether uh, you have to see whether that German company is an e commerce operator, then uh, your progress will apply. So, I think with this, uh, we have uh, concluded, uh, completed almost all the questions, and uh, whatever uh, uh, questions we had uh, framed for uh, this discussion, 
I think the 90 percent of us of that has been covered, and uh, I hope uh, the members who participated throughout this three hours uh, discussion, they have got uh, enough, uh, uh, like uh, I should say, the knowledge uh, on equalization levy. Of course, as I said in my earlier speech, it's an evolving subject. It's not that uh, this is the final aspect as such. So, as Narendra also said, that uh, we have entire uh, all the nations across the globe has to come into consensus on this equalization levy and. Uh, Digital taxation. Let us see what uh, is there in the store in the future. I should uh, thank once again. Uh, uh, I should thank all my panelists and also thank Bangalore Ranch for giving this opportunity. And over to you, the chairman and secretary of Bangalore. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, it was an excellent uh, presentation, almost uh, covered uh, to nearby uh, double century. <laughs> 200 minutes uh, almost we have covered. And I think uh, the subject name is uh, very simple by calling equalization levy. If you take uh, just uh, enter into that, it is an ocean. So it is yeah. not required three hours or two hours, maybe uh, not enough. We must have a workshop kind of uh, sessions. Uh, then only that, uh, that uh, we can able to cover at least uh, some of the uh, session so first of all i thank uh, the uh, bharat lakshmi narayana sir the all our chartered accountants group you are joined and uh, uh, excellently you are uh, presenting definitely sir upcoming days uh, we can have the workshop kind of sessions so always our motto is to jnana dasava we should not stop it our jnana it has to be continued wherever all professionals are uh, now the role of professionals are very important so my special thanks to Bharat Lakshmi Narayana uh, for uh, coming and addressing our members. And then again, uh, our own member always uh, available, Narendra Jain. Uh, so uh, Narendra Jain ji, very uh, thankful. And Thank definitely you, whenever, you call, whenever you call any sessions, the people are ready. So one of that uh, speaker, Narendra Jain. And uh, I could say then Sachin Kumar, uh, there is no this one. Uh, Always motivation he is working under the motivation office. The word uh, TN Manoran sir said that motivation always uh, for the eye opening. So, special thanks to Sachin Kumar sir for the addressing that becoming a private uh, discussion. Yes, uh, always you think, uh, think differently, act perfectly. So, we have to think that uh, how we can be this panel discussion. So, uh, sir is readily available, the who has served for the 18 years and uh, now he is for uh, resource persons. I wish him to come back to his uh, platform again. Uh, <laughs> my, uh, he, I wish him for his future endeavors. There is none other than today's moderator, uh, CA Kota Srinivas. Uh, special thanks to Kota Srinivas for uh, taking lead of the session and uh, making arrangement. And definitely we can have in upcoming days uh, more programs. So, before handing over to as I mentioned initially, on 16th uh, September, next Wednesday, we have a session on, a special session on cooperative sector, a practical case studies in gold loan. There was a gold loan, very much issues are arising. So, very important practical aspects is going to be discussed. And again, the comparison between two cooperative acts, we have no cooperative act 1959 and again Savar the act. Where exactly what is the difference uh, going to be addressed by Ravindranath Sagar and we are also invited uh, President of Savarda for address and uh, to highlight about the what is the chartered account and rule in cooperative society exactly. So uh, with that note uh, again my special thanks to all the panelists and moderator for ending more than minutes session the Bangor Bench Jnana Dasova. Definitely we are we'll have more sessions on uh, this note and i request our secretary to render the formal vote of thanks to the all our speakers and moderator and all our viewers go to thank you chairman uh, sir it was a brilliant session a lot of value addition happened uh, really it was a great session sir today for all the panelists and moderators a well moderated session by kota sir as our chairman said it was a fantastic session 
Now, I'll generally, we used to call it so like a global village. Now we can say, because of this webinars, we can say knowledge village. Wherever sitting it in our office, we can access to any knowledge anywhere. But only thing interest matters. Really, it was an excellent session. And I thank on behalf of uh, Bangalore branch of ICA for all the panelists, uh, um, Sachin Kumar sir and uh, Narendra Jain and Bharat Lakshmaran for uh, your uh, for knowledge sharing to the, all the members and viewers. And I also thank uh, Kota Srinivas moderating uh, this session. I thank on behalf of Bangalore branch of ICA all the moderator and um, moderator and panelists. And I also thank all the members for actively members. participating for. Uh, uh, for actively participating because it's a three hours uh, marathon session because after a long time we used to have uh, adjusted for only two hours session today it's more than three hours session still uh, members are actively participated i thank all the viewers and members for actively participating yeah, thank yeah. you all normally we have sir two hour sessions it's like century <laughs> so today we made it double century <laughs> again you, the sachin sir name is inspiring me to be a cricket thank you all Thank you, thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.